Hey there, Mr. Reddit here. Welcome back to another episode of r slash Entitled Parent Stories. Today we have a very special episode for you, a compilation of some of the greatest Entitled Parent Stories we read over the past year. So sit back, relax, and enjoy a few hours of the most Entitled Parents you've ever heard of. And by the way, Karen assured me that if this video gets 1000 likes, she won't try to speak to anyone's manager for an entire week. So please smash that like button. And if you're new, subscribe and turn on notifications for new stories from Reddit every single day. And become an official member of the ReArmy today, and I'll give you a shout out in an upcoming video. R slash Entitled Parents. Karen loses it on a Disney cast member. I was working at the Indiana Jones Epic Stunt Spectacular, or Epic as it was known to the cast members, and we had already closed the theater for the start of the show. When the theater gets to max capacity, we legally can't put more people in there because of fire code, etc. This woman barrels up to me, gets within six inches of my face, and waves her paper fast pass ticket in my face. She demanded to be allowed into the show and screams that her kid, a boy no more than six, needs to see this show or his day is ruined. She was screaming so loud, veins were popping out of the front of her head. I stood there, calm and collected, explaining to her that the theater is full and we can't let anyone else in. She pushes past me with one arm, holding her kid's arm in the other. She marches straight for the ropes that block the entrance and tries to hoist her son over the rope. Before she gets that far, a manager walks up and puts his hands in the air to try to contain the situation. He offers to get the kid an ice cream and provide VIP seats to the next show if she calms down and comes back later. After screaming about how rude I was to her, which I was not, she accepts the token of kindness. My manager turns to me and asks me how long my shift is today. I told him I was off work at 6.30. He nods and tells the irate woman that he will have me personally escort her to the VIP section down front. He writes her a ticket voucher for the ice cream and seats and she fumed off with not even a thank you. My manager turns to me and apologizes on behalf of her. Then he asks me, how many more shows do we have today? I looked at the clock and realized it was after 5 p.m. and well in the middle of our last show of the day. I looked at my manager as a sly smile crept across his face. He had just given an entitled parent a VIP pass to a show that won't happen. The respect I already had for him just skyrocketed through the roof. I was long gone by the time she came back, but I would love to imagine the look on her face when she came back at 7 for the last show. Kid got an ice cream and mom got mad. It was a win-win. Does anyone know what the difference is between Disneyland and Disney World? Please let me know. Update. Entitled parent teaching entitled kid how to drive after the court date. The cast. We've got entitled mom, entitled kid. We've got me, we've got my lawyer, her lawyer, the judge, and the policeman. This morning we had the court date. I've never been to court and I was surprised that it went like an actual courtroom scene minus the jury. It is to note that the helpful woman from the first post has gotten very sick, but we had the video and a statement from her to help. So I'm gonna cut to more of the important stuff. Warning, this will be a long one. First was the entitled family themselves, her lawyer. So, you were teaching your daughter how to drive, and she hit you in the Target parking lot while backing out? Entitled parent. Yes, she couldn't see out of the back windows due to a large truck and had a baby in the back seat. Her lawyer. And now, entitled kid won't drive because she's scared she'll hurt someone? Yes, she is very distraught. Her father is no longer in the picture, so she only has me to help, but she's going through therapy. Therapy she wouldn't need if OP would have been more careful. Her lawyer pretty much repeats the story with Entitled Kid, and then it's my turn. Her lawyer. Were you aware of the car behind the truck? Me. No, it was a lifted XL truck, so I had a woman help me to try to back out of my space as she had parked next to me. Her lawyer. And you almost hit the woman while backing out, correct? Me. No, that was your client. I'm sure when we watch the video you'll see otherwise, ma'am. You backed into the pedestrian lane before the driving lane, and that's when you hit my client and her daughter. No, that's not what happened. She hit me. Are you aware that Entitled Kid will not drive because of the accident? 
No, I'm not aware of that. That is all, Your Honor, for the defendant. I would like to call policemen up to the stand. After a bunch of questions about Entitled Kid and Entitled Parent's story, he took him off. After similar questions from my lawyer to Entitled Parent, Entitled Kid, and me, now he questioned policemen. My lawyer. The accident occurred in the public mall parking lot, correct? Policeman. Yes, that parking lot is under my department's jurisdiction, as it's next to the public park and mall, so Target doesn't own it. My lawyer. And you questioned everyone at the scene, correct? Policeman. Yes, I went through the protocol and got everyone's licenses, insurance, and Entitled Kids paperwork for her driving class to report. My lawyer. So you got Entitled Kids paperwork to report to her driving instructor she was in an accident. Do you know how long she had been learning? Policeman. Her paperwork said two days before the accident. My lawyer. And you are sure you got her permit on file? I'm not seeing her permit in the paperwork on file. In fact, judge, I would like to submit her permit, which started on March 3rd, one week after the accident. Policeman, what is the limit for that parking lot? Policeman goes silent, realizing he missed her license. I believe it is 10 miles an hour. My lawyer. According to the district's parking and public places laws, the speed limit for this lot is 5, due to the amount of people and pedestrian zones. Shows him the parking page. Policeman. I see, that is correct. My lawyer. I will also show the video from Target of the accident, which was not obtained at the time of the accident due to no acting manager on duty. Shows video to my new information that entitled parent was on her phone, not paying attention to her kid and just pointing around the big truck. Judge. Okay, that's enough from everyone. Entitled parent, you expect me to believe your story after that video? She hurt my baby. She's refusing to drive. She's the- I'm not finished. Do not interrupt me. One, your minor didn't have a license. If she was driving a tractor, it would be a different story, as those are covered under her ATV license of over the age of 13. However, you were in a four-wheel drive suburban, driving 15 miles per hour in a district parking lot. Two, you very clearly were not paying attention to your daughter driving, on the phone and presumably by the video telling your daughter to park behind the big truck, which you had no idea if it had anyone in it. Three, your daughter very clearly almost hit this woman, pointing to helpful lady, then went to hit OP's car before you even looked up. Your daughter is clearly unable to drive this car as she only has been in her class for two days before the accident according to her paperwork. 4. You wasted the time of this courtroom and my time in general by deciding to make this a big deal. Every learner after their first fender bender is shook up, dust them off and let them get back up. With all of this information, I rule in favor of the defense. I also request the offense pay reparations to the defense in the amount of, I will not disclose that and request this ruling and any rulings found on scene be taken to both parties' insurance to be evidence and re-evaluation for increases or decreases in premiums that may have occurred or that may occur in the future. Have a great day. Entitled parent to her lawyer. You said this was an easy win for you. Her lawyer. Yes, it would have been if you had not lied to me. So I left happy and am eating a late celebration lunch with cheesecake because I deserve it. The end. Speaking of cake, what's your favorite kind of cake? I love cheesecake. Old man tells me I should wear a sign that says I'm stupid around my neck. So this happened a few years ago. I was a cashier at a local grocery store and that day was handling the self checkouts. The self checkouts would break constantly and usually only take one type of payment or another, cash or card, but almost never both at a single register. This one day was pretty busy, and an elderly man comes up on a riding cart. I tell him the one he's chosen is cards only, which was on the screen and even provided a prompt you had to read and agree to before starting your checkout. He acknowledged me and the prompt and checked his groceries. As soon as he's finished, of course he pulls out cash and gets pretty frustrated the machine won't take it. I remind him the machine was cards only, but I could pull his order over to my register and finish his transaction there. The only issue was that we would have to wait a moment for a supervisor to approve it as it required a supervisor to suspend transactions and move them on to another register. He held his cash out to me and told me to just take the money and give him his change. He wanted me to open my register, 
an action that would also need a supervisor's approval. Do the math from the total on his screen and give him his change right then. I told him I couldn't do that, as a supervisor had to manually open the register for me when not in a transaction. And this grown man straight up looks at me and says, That's stupid. You should wear a sign around your neck that says you're stupid. Then he just left without his stuff. I was so dumbfounded at the time, I couldn't even fathom a response. His insult was just so out of left field. Mike finds a way to get rid of the problem employee. Years back, I worked for a large bank in the UK. We all worked on the same floor and in the same department, but within different teams. I was just passing through a second mint and saw the beginning of this revenge, but was filled in on the aftermath later. One of the teams was run by a woman called Sarah. Sarah was by many measures a good manager, but she had a blind spot. That blind spot was a woman called Helen. Now, when I was in my previous role, I interacted with Helen a fair bit and she had seemed friendly, but when it came to actually working with her, she was a nightmare. She'd tattle, steal ideas and credit, and generally throw you under the bus at any opportunity. I'm not sure why Sarah always protected her, but it soon became a sore point for most people on the floor who had to deal with her. Enter Mike, who was the manager of a smaller team. Mike could be a bit of a jerk, but was still professional and fun to work with. To give you an idea of his character, I found out I was being made redundant and even though he wasn't my manager, he heard about it and booked time out to help me with my CV and to interview practice. Shortly after, it was announced that Mike's smaller team was being dissolved and the staff either made redundant or moved to other teams. At the time of the cuts, the economy in the UK was in a bad state and all the banks were looking for efficiencies. He was redeployed and took the vacant manager role under Sarah that Helen had been gunning for. To make matters worse, Helen now reported directly to him. Helen was furious and spent no time in making her discontent known as she felt she was entitled to the promotion. Unfortunately for her, Mike was wise to her. They had both joined the company around the same time and so he knew exactly what she was like. He had even had her blame him for her mistakes before. Dropping even the projects she had gotten so much praise for had been work one of his staff had done. So he started the process of documenting her poor work and attitude to manage her out of the business. Sarah, however, would not allow it. Helen was a high performer in her eyes and she wouldn't sign off on getting rid of her. When I left the team, Mike was frustrated with her and wasn't sure what to do. I met up with Mike a year later and he shared how he had solved the Helen problem with me because he knew all of the issues I'd had with her. Because Sarah had his hands tied, his only other option to get Helen out of the team was for her to leave of her own accord. He couldn't oust her by making her life difficult or she'd go to Sarah, so he went the other way. The guy sat through every performance meeting with her for the rest of the year, gritting his teeth and praising her. That then justified him giving her a really high performance rating. He also used his own contacts to find roles in other teams at his grade that he then talked up to Helen. These roles were specifically selected because they specialized in one of the things Helen claims she was an expert at, but had very little real experience in. Basically, roles where he knew she'd have the highest chance of becoming overwhelmed. Eventually, she applied for one, and he spent several weeks coaching her for the interview. In the company at the time, the interviews were scored off of three main factors, performance rating in current role, competency-based interview results, and relevant experience. He had done everything he could to make her shine in all three, she took the promotion and within two months had quit the bank. He knew she wasn't ready for the responsibility, didn't have the skills, and her poor work ethic would be exposed. Worst case, she'd get her crap together and he'd still look like the perfect manager to Sarah. Have you ever had to work with someone that you just couldn't stand? If so, do you have any crazy stories about them? Please let me know. Entitled Parent decides that breaking even on a car isn't enough of a discount. So for context, I sell cars for a dealership. We had a car on the lot that was starting to get aged, so we brought the price down a little bit. A girl comes in with her entitled parent. They hand me some printouts of cars they would like to look at. I bring the cars around and we go for a drive. The girl absolutely loves the first car we drove, so we go back to the desk to write things up. The entitled mom then asks what her work discount would be. Sometimes we run discounts for people who work in certain fields. I explained that the car was already on sale 
and therefore could not be discounted anymore. The entitled mom immediately gets furious. This is ridiculous. My daughter is entitled to that discount, and nowhere does it state that it doesn't apply to already discounted cars. If I go to the store that offers a military discount, they don't deny me just because something is already on sale. As an ex-retail employee, I know this to not be true. Me. Ma'am, I understand your concern, but the car is very aggressively priced as is, and we cannot offer a greater discount. But I will go to my sales manager and see what we can do. Yes, you should do that. I then walk to my sales manager and ask him about it. After that, we find out that we have brought the car down to cost. There was a total of $435 of profit in this $22,990 car. For those who don't know, that's not very much. Remember, this doesn't include what they have to pay me for selling the car. But he then comes back and says he will give them $200 off. After some service costs and my commission, that will make the car a break even. Me. Well, great news. He said we didn't have much, but we could give you a little more of a discount. This way, we will essentially break even in the car. Entitled Mom. No, that doesn't work at all. $200 is hardly a discount on a $23,000 car. And that can't seriously be the discount she is entitled to. Me. Ma'am, this is better than the discount she would have gotten on the car. And at this price, we are not making money. We are simply breaking even. When did you take the car in? About a month ago. Is this a joke? You have a car you are trying to get rid of, and you are not offering us even the discount we are already entitled to? Keep in mind that the daughter is buying the car. The 27-year-old daughter. The parents aren't even co-signing. Me. Ma'am. Yes, the car has been here a little while, but we are not prepared to take a loss on it. At this price, we are going to break even, and that is what we feel comfortable doing on this car. You would better go talk to your boss again. I'll bet he disagrees. I then go to the manager again, and he reluctantly takes off another $200. We are now losing money on the car. Me. Well, after talking to the manager, our final offer is $400 off. I then hold out my hand to shake hers. Wow, you guys clearly don't understand how any of this works. You have a car here that you are begging people to take, and we are trying to buy it for the right price. Sometimes you have to take a loss on inventory that no one else wants. Then you make it up on another car. Duh. Ma'am, at its new pricing, we have appointments on it. We aren't prepared to lose more than $200 on the car. I'm sorry. Well, where is her discount? You advertise this discount and you're not giving it to her? That's false advertising. Me. Ma'am, I've already explained that we are giving her the best discount we can offer. This discount is far better than what we advertised. At this point, we are done. If you want the car at this price, then buy it. If not, then don't. You will not talk to me like that. You are here to work a deal. And once we feel we are getting a deal, we will then buy a car. Ma'am, this is the final price, period. Take it or leave it. I took a commission cut to give you this discount, I might add. I don't care about your commission. You probably scam other people out of their money. You finally have a customer who knows how this all works, and you are trying to scam us too. Me. Ma'am, have a great rest of your day. Finally, the daughter speaks up. Daughter. Sir, I will buy the car at that price. Me. Okay, please sign here. The entitled mom continued acting like a brat the entire time we were filling out paperwork. She continued to try and argue, and she would catch her daughter's hand and tell her to wait before signing. Finally, my manager had to ask the entitled mom to leave. The daughter continued to buy the car after the mom had left and was actually very pleasant, even agreed to buy my dinner since I was losing commission. Customer has trouble understanding the concept of buy one, get one free. I'm working at the store self-checkout and a customer comes through and in her basket were vitamins that was if you buy two of them, one will be free. She scans through her order and when she gets to the end, she tells me that there was something wrong with her order. It was concerning the vitamins that were BOGO. Buy one, get one free. Now, usually the problem with those items is that they don't come off the order immediately. Instead, they come off when the customer hits pay now. That wasn't the problem. The free one came off, but apparently the price of the vitamins was supposed to be $24.99. Instead, both of them were coming up at $27.99. So I go and check the aisle quickly because it was nearby 
and find no reason to dispute her claim, so I decided to go ahead and fix it. The problem was that I couldn't go into the item and change its price because if I did that, the system would not recognize the vitamins as the BOGO and she would be charged for both items. I tell her this and instead I tell her I would ring up a $3 coupon for her so that she can get the right price, two vitamins that would cost $24.99 total. I finish this and I go to help other customers at the self-checkout because at the time we were swamped. As I finish helping out everyone else, a couple minutes later I notice the lady was still there, not happy. I go up to her and ask, is everything okay ma'am? She angrily tells me, no, everything isn't alright. You still need to fix the price on the other one. At this point, I'm confused, so I ask her to clarify. She says, You only took off the three dollars from one of them. You need to take it off the other as well. I try to explain to her that because the other item was already free, there was no need to take off the three dollars on the other one. Because it was already free, you are not owed three more dollars because it already came off. She doesn't get it insisting that I need to take the $3 off of the other one. Eventually, she just says, Fine, I won't buy this. But thankfully, or unthankfully, I'm able to get it through to her that because the item was already free, it can't go any lower, and it was already at the correct price. She pays for her items and leaves the store. Jerk gets exactly what he asked for. Last night, I worked a 14 top. They were all terrible people, jerkiest people I have ever come in contact with. The royal family of Jerkland. One guy sits down and orders a beer. He says, Every time you come to the table, I want you to have a beer for me. I thought he was probably just joking. So I leave and come back and he says, Where's my beer? Did you really forget what I told you like two minutes ago? Wow. So I said, Oh, I'm so sorry. It won't happen again. So for the next two hours, no matter what, every single time, I approached the table, I left a beer. After about 45 minutes, it began to pile up. A friend of King Jerk tried to take one that I put down, but I grabbed it and said, Sorry sir, this is your friend's. I'd be happy to get you one if you'd like. Long story short, he ended up buying 25 of them at $8 a pop with a 20% mandatory auto grad on the table. He maybe drank four. I have never felt so good in my life. It doesn't pay to be an arrogant jerk, folks. Edit. Man, thanks everyone. This was a crowning achievement in my seven years of serving. I work at a place where some people come in and treat me like a piece of stew meat, and I have learned to play the game in order to make money. I love my job and the people I meet, but I get stepped on a lot. It's nice to win one and have you guys appreciate it. To answer some questions, they split the bill seven ways. They did not even look at the charges. I put down the bill and the cards went on top. Their total bill was about $1,200, everything included beer, food, and all. This is not common at a 14 top where I work, but not surprising. I came out making around $240 before tip out. I work at an independent fine dining Italian restaurant outside of Chicago. Every time I put a beer down, he said nothing. If he would have acknowledged my presence and told me to stop, I would have. He said nothing. I started to feel bad for a couple minutes, and then he yelled at me like a dog to get the food out faster. That is what he wanted. I just want to reiterate that. He asked for it. Also, I was watching him drink it. If at any point his behavior or consumption had increased, I would have stopped. He walked out the exact same way he walked in, like a jerk. Karen demands free food for her starving brats. I was eating at a restaurant when the power went out. The employees were frantically trying to get the power back up, but it didn't work. They were apologizing to customers and telling them the meal would be free. They put up signs on the door saying there was no power and they were closed for the day. I paid for my meal since I was more or less done with my food. I was speaking to the manager about the power outage. She was explaining that they would probably be closed for the day since the electrician could only come in the morning the next day. The employees couldn't even clean up the kitchen as it was in total darkness there except for a few emergency lights. I was grabbing my jacket and was about to leave when this woman with two kids came up to the restaurant. She went in and said, Hi, table for three, please. Manager apologized and explained that the power was out and they were closed for the day. Entitled mom said she heard that the restaurant was giving out free food, so she wanted some as well. Told manager that the kids weren't fussy and they would be in and out in a jiffy. She told the manager to just grab a couple of leftovers, which they didn't serve, and to let her have it. 
but also to make sure no other customers had touched it. Manager had to explain that all the food in the restaurant was cooked to order and the chef wasn't able to cook anything once the power went out as there was no light. They have to fix the problem first as it was a safety hazard. Entitled mom went nuts and screamed that they were going to starve and it was all their fault. Said they were doing it on purpose because they wanted to close up early for the day and it was her right to demand that they serve her food. She said she knew that they just wanted to keep all of the food for themselves. Manager was visibly annoyed and told the lady to leave as there was no way they would be able to serve her any food today and even if they could, they wouldn't. Entitled mom stood there raging and complaining for 10 minutes before realizing that no one was going to do anything and left, but not before kicking a chair on her way out. Karen tries to get me fired and arrested. This was the very early 90s before the internet or the Karen phenomenon. I live in a small town in a rural county. I worked for a local law enforcement agency during the day and had a large retailer at night scrubbing and waxing the floors. It was a ton of hours, but you gotta pay the bills. This afforded my wife the opportunity to work normal hours and be there to take care of our kids. Our sons were three and four at the time. One night I was particularly tired. Things were pretty much caught up at work and I was wandering around in full zombie mode. My manager told me to go ahead and wrap up my work and clock out at midnight. I usually worked until 4 a.m. I get home about 20 minutes later to find a strange car in my driveway and a strange man in my house. I walked in my room and couldn't believe what I saw. I have always prided myself in being able to control even the most dangerous situations by talking people down and avoiding any use of force, no matter how tense things got. I just stood there and ordered him to get out of my house and take her with him. I was beyond furious, but I managed to hang on to the last strand of control that I had. As they ran out of the house, I shouted after her that she could come pick up her things from the yard in a couple of days. Fast forward three days. I am a total wreck. I haven't slept and barely have eaten and have been walking around borderline in shock. My wife and kids were my entire world and it was all suddenly torn down around me. I called my supervisor at the department and told him everything that happened and asked for a few mental health days. He agreed and gave me the time off. I didn't need to be around the public in that state of mind with a weapon. We have legal insurance at work. It works like medical insurance. You pick a lawyer from a list of providers and their specialty for discounted or even free services. The lawyer I chose was in the next county in the big city. Our meeting did not go well. She advised me that even with what had happened, the court would most likely rule that since she is the mother, she gets the kids and I would have to pay her child support, which is exactly what happened. It was a different time back then. I staggered out of her office feeling like I had been kicked in the gut. I was already in very bad shape and this just pushed it to 11. My mouth was very dry and my throat felt like it would close. I desperately needed something to drink. This was a very posh part of town. Very old homes and very old money. Just down the road from the yacht club and such. There were no convenience stores anywhere to be found. There was, however, a rather high-end grocery store nearby. I really did not want to be around people, but I was desperate for something to drink. I was dangerously dehydrated, so I went in. This is where our story begins. Cast of characters. We've got Cruella de Vil. We've got Nice Lady. We've got store manager, police officer, and me, tired wreck of a man falling apart at the seams. I should start by saying that I was wearing tan khakis and a green polo shirt. The employees of this store wore either black or tan khakis and green polos with the store logo on it. A slightly different shade of green, but not enough to notice unless we were standing side by side. I was on the drink aisle staring at the bottles of Gatorade, Powerade, etc., but I wasn't really noticing anything. I was staring straight through the shelves. My mind was a million miles away. I suddenly felt a sharp pain in my left upper arm as someone grabbed me hard and tried to snatch me around. Out of instinct and training, I grabbed the wrist with my right hand, put my left hand on their upper arm, and put them into the support column next to the shelf. I quickly looked around to check my surroundings and noticed five or six customers staring at what was happening. I then looked at my attacker. It was a scrawny old lady. I released her and stepped back. Remember the original 101 Dalmatians movie? She looked very much like Cruella de Vil from that film. 
hair that was obviously colored, long fake nails and way too many rings, and a necklace that looked like a string of small Christmas ornaments. Even though she looked to be in her late 60s, she must go to aerobics or something because she had some decent muscle tone under her saggy, overly tanned, leathery skin. As she was composing herself, I heard the nice lady behind me ask if I was okay. I turned to look at her, and she pointed at my arm. I looked down and saw blood running down my arm and dripping on the floor. When I pulled her hand off of my arm, two of her fake nails must have cut my skin. It wasn't actually bad, I just bleed very easily. At this point, I hear, I turned towards Cruella de Vil, just in time to hear, How dare you, peasant? Yes, she called me a peasant. Do you know who my husband is? Then she reached back to take a swing at me. As she tried to slap me, I simply stepped back at the last second, causing her to miss. She lost her balance and fell forward. She knocked several drink bottles off of the shelf and fell face first into a shelf, causing her lip and nose to bleed. About this time, the manager rounded the corner and asked what was going on. Apparently, he saw her try to hit me and fall down. Cruella de Vil. I want this troglodyte. Gotta love her vocabulary. Fired and arrested. The manager looks at me and tells her that I do not work here. B.S. He ignored me and refused to assist me. About this time, I saw a local police officer rounding the corner. Apparently, one of the customers had the store call them as soon as this all started. Officer must have been very nearby. Excellent response time. Cruella putting on her best victim face. Oh, thank God you're here. I am Mrs. Cruella de Vil, and I want this monster arrested. He tried to hurt me. Cue the sad puppy dog eyes and crocodile tears. Nice lady. Excuse me, officer. That's not what happened at all. She grabbed him and... Stop lying to cover for him, you trollop. Her spectacular vocabulary again. Me, holding up my department ID for the officer to see. I do not work here. I work at my local department. Me, turning to store manager and pointing up. Do those cameras work? Nice lady. Excuse me, officer. See the blood on his arm? Pointing to my scratches. That's where she... Stop lying for him. My husband is Mr. Cruella de Vil, and you'll do what I say right now, or I will call him. Officer. Ma'am, maybe it's best that we come to the manager's office to discuss this. As we all turned to leave, he asked the manager to take her to his office while he talked to me for a second. Officer, having apparently dealt with this before. Okay, so what actually happened? I told him and reminded him that it will all be on tape as I pointed back up to the camera mount. Nice lady. Officer, I can tell you that she was screaming at him for a while and then attacked him for no reason. I was on the aisle and saw the whole thing. Then she looked at me. Didn't you hear her screaming at you? Me. I'm sorry, I was lost in thought. I didn't notice her until she grabbed me. I also have pretty bad tinnitus from my time in the military, so that could have also contributed to me missing Cruella's gentle requests for my assistance. Officer. Thank you, ma'am. I'll need your contact info for the report and possible testimony. Turning to me. I'll need your info as well. I gave him one of my department business cards. He advised me to let my department know right away. He also told me that her husband is actually someone very important in the city. He was a retired city commissioner and former CEO of a big insurance agency and that had many big city leaders, all the way up to the mayor's office, more basically in his pocket. I went directly to my supervisor's office and told him the whole story. He had me fill out an incident report and all supplemental forms. He said it sounded like a clear case of self-defense, especially if it was all on camera. She'd probably be charged since there were injuries. And that was it. Nothing else ever happened. I never heard another thing. I called my uncle who was a longtime officer in that department and my inspiration for going into law enforcement and he couldn't find anything about it. No police report or anything. It was all swept under the rug and forgotten. I guess the moral of the story here is that money talks. Except for three more quick in and out trips to the lawyer's office, I never went to that part of town ever again. Karen lets her brat eat my emergency candy stash. I'm a type 1 diabetic. I'm a family law mediator and I work at a downtown courthouse. There's no food or drink allowed and the closest store is about a mile away. Despite this, my supervisors allow me to have my own stash of candy in my office in case of emergency. I'm type 1 diabetic and sometimes I need a bit of sugar. 
It's just a small Ziploc bag with M&Ms. Anyway, yesterday morning I was mediating a couple over custody of their twin eight-year-olds. They all showed up in pajamas and sweats and the parents couldn't be bothered to control their kids. The twins were running around the table, standing on the chairs and spinning in them, smearing their hands on the windows, just being disruptive. At one point, they started tugging at their mom and begging for something to eat. It had only been 30 minutes. Entitled Mom. Where's your vending machine? Me. We don't have any of those. I'm sorry. Well, why not? Food isn't allowed in the building, ma'am. But our session is almost over. Kid 1. She's lying, Mom. I saw food in the candy drawer. Kid 2 lit up when he heard this. Ran towards me, knocking over our documents from the table and pushing my arm out of the way and opened my candy drawer. It wasn't a candy drawer, by the way. It was just the drawer I kept my stationary supplies and my M&Ms. I stood up in between the kid and the drawer as he rummaged through it, completely irritated at this point. I closed the drawer and asked the parents if they wanted to reschedule. Entitled Dad, You almost slammed my boy's hand over some candy. That was a gross over-exaggeration, of course. I told them I needed that candy because of my diabetes, to which Entitled Mom gave me an incredibly dirty look. If you've got diabetes, you don't need the candy. Just let them have some for goodness sake. Me. I'm type 1 diabetic. I'm sorry, but we're going to need to reschedule. Entitled Dad started arguing with Entitled Mom about how she always ruins everything, and Entitled Mom responded by doubling down on her stance. She's wanting to kick us out because sugar is like drugs to diabetes. Entitled Dad and Entitled Mom continued to argue, and as I went to call in for security, Kid One stuck his foot out and tried to trip me. Luckily, I didn't fall, but he distracted me just enough for Kid Two to pull open the drawer and take the bag. The twins started running around, tossing the M&Ms at each other and trying to catch it in their mouths while the entitled parents continued to yell at each other. I called security, which stopped the entitled parents arguing. Are you seriously calling security over candy? I think that was the point I lost all professionalism. Me. I needed that in case my blood sugar gets too low. Now look, it's all over my carpet and your kid's hands. Security came up and the twins tried to bolt out of the room unsuccessfully. Entitled Dad and Security nearly got into a fight before being forced to leave. I took my break early and got another bag of M&Ms. Speaking of M&Ms, what's your favorite candy of all time? Please let me know right now. Next we've got, are you deaf? So this just happened and I'm actually kind of proud of it. A bit of backstory, I stay with my kids during the day and work nights. My husband and I have opposite shifts so we can save on daycare. Because of this, I don't usually go grocery shopping during the week because it can be difficult getting my kids through the store. My daughter sometimes has meltdowns in big crowds. She doesn't have any sensory issues according to her doctor. We think she just doesn't like the noise or just gets tired easy and that makes her fussy. I remembered that I was supposed to get party supplies for work today because one of the ladies there is going on maternity leave and I had volunteered to help set up a party for her. So off to the store we all go and everything goes surprisingly well. I'm getting ready to check out at the self-scanner when it happens. I feel a tap on my shoulder followed by the excuse me that we all know and dread. So I turn around. My mistake. Despite the tone used, the lady seemed relatively normal. No care in haircut until she started talking. Excuse me, this won't scan. I look around and she is definitely talking to me. Now, I would normally help, even if someone is rude, because why not? However, her tone and pitch was harsh enough that my daughter started clinging to my arm. My son just doesn't care. Lady, excuse me, hello, a little help? I'm just focused on my daughter, rubbing her back because I feel her start to freak out. How this lady thought I could help is beyond me. I don't work there and was dressed like I literally rolled out of bed. Fortunately, the self-checkout attendant shows up and asks what the problem is. Lady, this won't scan and this person, gesturing vaguely in my direction, is no help. Lady turns back to me while the attendant tries to ring out the item for her. You are so rude. Are you deaf or something? At this point, I still hadn't said a word to her and the idea hit me like a beautiful rainbow wrapped in lightning. I'm not deaf, but me and my kids are learning American Sign Language. 
I just started learning it so I can ask basic questions and can sign the baby shark song. Don't ask, my kids love it. Smiling the biggest smile I could manage, I start signing. It makes no sense. I'm basically saying, how are you? Do you want food? What is your name? I know a little sign, baby shark song. I never saw someone lose color in their face so fast in my entire life. It was glorious. She got her items, paid, and practically ran out of there. The attendant trying her best not to laugh. I turned to the attendant and said cheerfully, have a nice day. She and I shared a good laugh and I went home. P.S. My daughter is fine. She probably just got scared. Entitled mom says it's okay if I buy her kid a snack. I don't know either of them. My husband likes to tease me that I'm a magnet for drama, especially with entitled people. If I go out to do errands, it's almost guaranteed that I'll have a run-in with someone. I guess I just have that kind of face that lets people think, yeah, let's mess with her. Anyway, on to the first of many experiences I've had. Several years ago, when my oldest was 14, he played basketball for our local recreational center league. His team made it to the semifinals of the championship, so we had to spend most of our morning on the Saturday the games were being held. Now, the rec center isn't very large, but they decided to hold all of the playoff games there. The gym had two full-sized courts, which meant only two games could be played at a time. There was about 15 minutes before my son's game, so I took my younger son to the vending machine to get a snack. Now, because all of the games were in one spot, the time before and after each game was absolute chaos with people trying to come and go. We managed to slip through the crush and duck into the small alcove that housed the vending machines. When we arrived, there was a girl, entitled kid, already there, maybe seven or eight. She was standing in front of the candy machine, just eyeing everything. Younger son and I stepped over to the soda machine to get him a drink, then moved over to the candy machine. Without a word, entitled kid stepped to the side to let us look. My son pointed out a Snickers bar that he wanted, so I inserted the money, pushed the right buttons, and watched the candy bar fall. Before he could bend down to grab it, Entitled Kid had already snatched it from the machine. Me, excuse me, that's not yours, sweetie. I hold out my hand for her to give it back. Entitled Kid, clutching the candy. It's okay, my mom said you could buy me a treat. Me, confused. Who's your mom? Entitled Kid turned to point towards the crowd of people, but I couldn't see who she was supposed to be pointing to. I grab the candy bar back while she's not paying attention and hand it to my son who was looking a bit confused at this point. Entitled Kid began to cry, which was a homing beacon for her Entitled Mom. Entitled Mom suddenly appeared besides her daughter. She's wearing a ton of makeup. Her blonde hair is teased and frozen in places with extra strength hairspray. She's orange from a bottle or two of self-tanner, and her clothes are two sizes too small. What's wrong, honey? She took my candy bar. Entitled Mom turned to me, her face already twisted in anger but I cut her off. Me. Is she your daughter? Entitled mom, a bit surprised that I cut her off. Yes. Me. Why did you tell her that it was okay for me to buy her something? I don't know you or her. Why would I do that? Entitled mom scoffs. Well, you... Well, nothing. You're her mom. You buy her something if she's hungry. I've learned that if you don't let entitled people build up steam, they give up pretty quick. I grabbed my son and led him back to our seats in the gym. I'm not sure if Entitled Mom yelled after us because the noise level was high, but I didn't care. Turns out, Entitled Mom's son was on the opposing team, so she sat on the other side of the gym, glaring at me throughout the entire game, not cheering for her son. My son's team beat hers, by the way. How I Quit Selling Appliances About a week before Black Friday one year, I had a customer come into my store, really interested in redoing his whole kitchen appliance setup. I talked to him about what he needed, fridge size, etc., but it quickly became apparent that he had his mind set on a certain fridge. Size didn't matter. Okay, then came the oven, then the microwave, then the dishwasher. I didn't recommend Samsung dishwashers because at the time, they just didn't work. Told him to get the Bosch for a couple hundred less because it worked well and matched the style. He would have none of it. Part 2. We sat down at the counter with all of the model numbers written down. I find that we have tons of the models in question in stock. When I quoted him the price, he kind of chuckled and said, Oh no, I'm not paying that. I had already applied the Samsung bundle pricing to it. We went back and forth a few times. It came out of his mouth. 
I want the Black Friday pricing. And I kind of stuttered. He saw the Black Friday leak for it and wanted that pricing about a week early. I explained that I couldn't do that, back and forth. Manager got involved. Manager just kind of waved his hand and made it happen. Part 3. Delivery was straight up for this guy. I told him I could have them delivered and installed the next day, given that he has a proper kitchen set up for the given appliances. If he has a proper water line, we can install the fridge's water line and place it. If he has a proper microwave, oven head, we can install it. If he has a proper dishwasher water line and spot, it'll all work. It's all proper, he says. We set it all up with proper setups being there. Set the install and setup date for the 27th. Part 4 I get a call from a customer of mine on the 22nd. He wants to change his delivery date. Okay, let's do that. He wants a full Samsung kitchen scheduled for the 27th change to the 23rd. Next day delivery. I can't do that. The schedule is filled up. This guy started going crazy and I realized who he was. This line has stuck with me for life. When I ordered these, I was told that I could get next day delivery. I'm asking for next day delivery. Why has the story changed? The story has changed because it's a different story now. I can't deliver these tomorrow. Well, I sold all of my appliances on Craigslist and they picked them up today. I need them tomorrow. You what? I don't have any appliances for Christmas because I sold mine. I need the ones I bought now. I don't know how his Christmas went. He didn't have his appliances. He had an empty kitchen. Part 4 I was sitting at the desk checking on orders and stuff after getting back from my Christmas and this guy sat down in the chair in front of me without my noticing. Oh, hey, can I help you? You know why I'm here. And suddenly it clicked. It was this guy. Yeah, no, hold on, I'll be back. I didn't come back. I just got my manager. My manager then railed into this guy about how he agreed to give him Black Friday pricing a week before Black Friday. About how he signed a piece of paper agreeing to take delivery a certain day and how the next day delivery the week of Christmas was impossible. The customer then explained how his family had to go through Christmas without a kitchen because they sold their old appliances on Craigslist and my manager just laughed at him. The dude got real mad. All said and done, he took his delivery the scheduled day. Turned out the Samsung fridge was too large for his space. He needed a counter depth and the fridge stuck out way too far. He didn't have a water line for the fridge so they couldn't install the ice maker. His old microwave was not mounted correctly and the installers would not install the microwave unless he paid to have a power line installed for it. He lost his dang mind. Part 5 or why I quit. The 30th rolled around and I came to work to a full voice mailbox and five voicemails about this situation ranting. I called him back and he was just raging mad. I went into autopilot and explained that he picked out these appliances. It wasn't my fault they didn't fit. It wasn't my fault his previous microwave was hardwired like a hood, etc, etc. I gave him a new fridge that fit for the same price. He was upset that it was a smaller capacity. I explained it was what his kitchen allowed. I took a hit on commission for this order to fulfill this for him, etc. I set up the new delivery for the next day, New Year's Eve. He didn't want delivery on New Year's Eve. He wanted it today. And the following exchange took place. Because you guys have messed this up. My wife has to work tomorrow, New Year's Eve. Normal people don't have to work New Year's Eve. And now she does. So I can't take delivery tomorrow. Well, I work tomorrow too. I understand. Yeah, you do. I want them today. I can't do that. I can do New Year's Day or the day after. We're not taking time out of our New Year's Day to do this. Make it the second. And after going home that day, I just stopped going back into work and got drunk because this guy so successfully broke me down that I didn't really want to live anymore. Edit. I'll clarify. We offered next day delivery and installation in general. This was offered to the customer at the time of purchase. <laughs> okay, that's nice. Can I go back to work now? Firstly, a few things. I am a 4 foot 11 woman with a baby face. I am wearing my work uniform the entire time through this story. I'm petty. I work in a small shop with a very small range of customers. The shop specializes in a hobby mainly of middle aged men. One day an older woman came into the shop and asked to see Brian, name changed, to help her get her husband a gift. Today was Brian's day off and I was the only person in at the moment as the others were unloading stock. Me. I'm sorry ma'am, Brian isn't in today. I can help you. Oh, what would a young lady like you be doing here? My, 
You look 10. Me. Yes, I get mistaken a lot. But what do you need help with? No, no, no. I want Brian. He works here. Ma'am, I work here. Don't lie. Where's the manager? I am the manager. True. Oh, shush. You don't work here. You don't even have the right uniform on. I was wearing the bright blue uniform with the logo on it. Eventually, she just let me help her and then started saying that I was obviously lying, but it was kind of me to help her. She kept talking to me while I was helping some other customers. Me. That's nice, ma'am. Now please let me do my job. Oh, stop lying. She went on at me for a while, so I decided to tell her a little white lie. Me. Ma'am, you really are right about me. Honestly, I can't believe you figured it out. And I was asked to work here to see if someone could figure it out. Now you've won a prize. Oh my, really? Yes, here is the rest of the set for your husband, totally free. She was so excited and left the store thanking me. I then paid for the set I gave her. It was just replaceable characters, in case of duplicates being needed. Edit. The woman was a little rude to me, but overall she was very sweet. I just wanted her to leave because I had to close the store soon. It was the last shift. Edit 2. The woman's husband came in today and apologized for some of the things his wife said to me. He then thanked me for the extra figures because he wanted duplicate sets for his brother and son. Karen gets mad she can't return costume the day before Halloween. First things first, I've worked for the same Halloween company for four years. The first year we were open, we didn't accept any returns or exchanges at all, but the next three we did them, but within a certain time frame. Plus, you needed to have your receipt. This last year, our return policy was printed out on the receipt and there was a huge sign directly behind the checkout counter. So, now that I've set the scene, we've got Entitled Woman and we've got me. Entitled Woman walks in with her bag and receipt in hand and stands in the very long line. Me. I can help whoever is next. Yeah. Hi, I'd like to return this. Throws a bag on the counter. Well, unfortunately, as it's the day before Halloween, I can't return it for you. Well, why not? It says on the receipt that you guys do returns or exchanges. Yes, but look! She shoves the receipt in my face. It was already towards the end of the Halloween season, and I was already done with everything and everyone at this point. So I'm not too proud of the way I talked to her. But it is what it is. And it made me feel really good to sort of stand up for myself. Me. Yeah, and if you keep reading, it says up to seven days before Halloween. And today is the day before Halloween, making it less than seven days, so I can't return it for you. Well, how am I supposed to know that? Who looks at the receipt anyway? I bought these costumes on the 25th, so you should allow me to return it. Me. Well, whoever rung you up should have informed you all sales were final, and unfortunately we can't do any returns. I'm sorry if they didn't, but there isn't anything I can do to help you. This is BS. She continued to yell at me for not doing the return for her. I was already frustrated, and if she had been nice from the beginning, then I probably would have done it for her, with a valid explanation. Me. Well, I'm really not supposed to do this, being as it's the day before Halloween, but if you want to exchange it for something of equal or greater value, then I can do that for you. But I will not give you any money back. No, there is nothing that I want. Give me a return. You're stealing from me robbing me of my money. Well, I'm sorry ma'am. There's absolutely nothing I can do to help you then. Well, is there a phone number I could call? Yeah, I'm sure if you google it, there's a number that'll pop up. Have a nice day now. I've got lots of people behind you. I hope you know you just ruined my kid's Halloween, and you're a terrible person. I don't know how you can sleep at night. Speaking of Halloween, what was the last costume you wore? Please let me know. Entitled Dan freaks out when I get a purple cast for my broken arm. I broke my arm when I was around 10. Myself and a group of friends had been playing at the swing park and I fell off the climbing frame. The first thing I felt was an immense pain in my arm. It was so bad that I actually felt sick from the pain. My friends, understandably, freaked out and ran off in search of an adult while a couple of them stayed with me in case my arm fell off while they were gone. This is a terrifying situation when you're 10. Eventually, my friends came back with one of their dads. He quickly checked my arm over and was around 80% sure that it was broken. He offered to drive me home and would tell me jokes in an attempt to cheer me up. He succeeded in making my friend cringe at his dad's jokes 
and I felt myself relax a little. I was still in immense pain, but I wasn't worried about my arm falling off anymore. Eventually, we got to my house and my friend's dad explained to my mom what happened. He's such a great guy. He even offered to take my mom and I to the hospital. My mom politely declined because the guy had to go to his work and she didn't want him getting into trouble. Once he had left, my mom asked me all the usual worried parent questions. What happened? Where does it hurt? Do you feel sick? Etc. She then called my nice aunt to see if she could drop us off at the hospital. She was working though, and even though she told my mom she was leaving work ASAP, she would take about an hour and a half to get to our house because of how far away her work was. That left only one option, entitled aunt. Surprisingly, she did actually seem somewhat worried when my mom told her what had happened and she got to our house within 15 minutes. Entitled cousin was staying with her dad overnight, so she didn't come with us. Heck, she even brought my sweets to cheer me up. It honestly felt like I was in an episode of The Twilight Zone. Everything is going about as well as it could with my arm in a massive amount of pain. We get to the hospital, give the hospital all the required information, and head to the waiting room for what we expected to be a very long wait. The hospital is very busy. My mom takes me towards the kids' waiting area so I could play with the toys whilst I waited. Entitled Aunt following behind. I settled for playing with one of the plastic trucks so that I didn't have to move my broken arm. Everything was fine until a girl, around 6 or 7, asked me if I wanted to play kitchens with her, which I immediately said yes to. She set out some plastic cups for a tea party and we played quite happily. Until Entitled Aunt decides to intervene like the interfering jerk that she is. Entitled Aunt. What are you doing, sweetheart? Me. Playing kitchens with Sarah. I don't know, just figured she needed a name. Entitled Aunt. I thought you were playing with the trucks. Why don't you go get one of them? They're so cool. Me. But me and Sarah are playing. OP. Boys don't play kitchens. That's for girls. Me. But uncle, my mom's brother, is a cook and he's a boy. But you don't want to be a person like him, do you? Mom. Entitled Aunt. He's playing with that girl. Leave him alone. You don't think it's weird? Mom, getting pretty impatient. No, I don't. Now either leave them alone or you can head home. Entitled Aunt rolled her eyes at the pet name. My mom, even now, likes using pet names for me. She has a lot of anxiety around making sure that I know she loves me and cares about me. But she went back to my mom and sat down. Sarah and I talked and played for a bit. She asked me about my arm and I told her what happened. I found out through our talks that she had gotten her ears pierced but the company hadn't cleaned the equipment properly, which had led to her right ear becoming infected. Despite her mother cleaning it thoroughly every day, she went on to tell me that she was going to get the earring taken out and once she felt better, her mom would take her to get her ears re-pierced at a different establishment. Despite the hassle she was going through at that point in time, Sarah was pretty proud of her ear piercings, which in turn made me think about getting my own ears pierced. I had run over to my mom to ask about maybe getting my own ears pierced with the money that I had saved up. I got pocket money for helping around the house and always liked to save it for things that I really wanted or for my mom's birthday or Christmas presents. Entitled Aunt scoffed and made faces of disgust. As my mom would say, she looked like a dog chewing a wasp, but she didn't vocalize any of her concerns. After about an hour, I was called up to get x-rayed. I said my goodbyes to Sarah and headed to the x-ray room with my mom. I'll skip all of the boring stuff. Basically, I got my arm x-rayed. It was definitely broken, and we were taken to a little room. There were about four beds in the room, each with a curtain for privacy, where we were to wait for one of the nurses to arrive and sort out a cast for my arm. Entitled Aunt had been allowed to join us at this point, as the hospital only allowed one adult to accompany their kid to the x-ray room. Never really understood why. She was still pretty upset about my mom getting impatient with her earlier, so obviously she dropped the nice demeanor and pet names and went back to her typical jerk self. She kept her mouth shut for the most part until the nurse decided to ask the question. The question that would make Entitled Mom lose her crap. Nurse, what color of cast would you like, sweetie? Entitled Aunt, he likes the blue. It's the same color as his top. Nurse, is the blue one okay for you? She asks me this with a look that tells me, you don't have to go with the color that this psycho wants. Me. I like the purple one. Entitled Aunt just glares at me. Nurse. Okay, honey. A purple cast it is. Entitled Aunt. What? 
You're actually going to give him a purple cast? Nurse, well, that's what he wants. Mom, entitled Ant, give it a rest. It's a dang color. Entitled Ant, so? It's purple. Boys wear blue, not purple. Mom, it's not like you're the one who has to wear it. Stop being a drama queen. Entitled Ant, you're loving this, aren't you? You want him to be like this. You're encouraging this kind of behavior. Mom, looking like she wants to throw hands. I want my kid to be happy. If a purple cast is going to make him happy, then he's getting a purple cast. Boy shouldn't be wearing purple. He's getting the blue one. It's almost the same as purple anyways. Me. But if blue's the same as purple, can I just have purple? Are you a girl? No, but I like purple. Mom, OP isn't your kid, and I'm not having you make him feel like crap for liking a certain color. At this point, the nurse is trying to defuse the situation, and I can only look on in shock. They argued for a couple of minutes more until the nurse managed to get a hold of a doctor and another nurse, who quickly asked Entitled Aunt to leave the premises. She did, but not without getting the last word in by shouting, You're a terrible mother, wanting your son to be like this. My mom proceeded to apologize to the doctor and nurses for stooping to Entitled Aunt's level. They told her it wasn't an issue and that Entitled Aunt was out of line. Entitled Aunt had naturally drove off and left us at the hospital for another half hour until Nice Aunt came to pick us up. She had stopped off at KFC, my favorite fast food place as a kid, to get us something to eat and had gotten me a teddy bear at toy shop in town. It was bright purple. Nice Aunt was quick to post a picture of the three of us and the new teddy bear on Facebook, knowing full well that Entitled Aunt would see it just to upset her a little bit more. Entitled Aunt actually blocked both my mom and Nice Aunt on Facebook after this incident and we had no contact with her for about two and a half years. She eventually got in contact with my mom and sent her a massive apology through text and told her how she just wanted to be a family again. Jerk, you cut contact with us. All we did was enjoy the peace and quiet. Anyways, turns out that she was moving house and since she barely has any friends or family that actually like her, she was using us to help her move because paying someone to help is too expensive when I have family to help me. Also, if anyone is wondering about why my mom let her back in her life, Entitled Aunt was a pretty religious person and my mom just believed that was why she was like this. Of course, neither of us believe that all religious people are like that. We have many Christian etc. friends and they're all wonderful people. Needless to say, no one else had an issue with my cast. Some of the kids at school playfully teased me about it, but it wasn't malicious and they were just more excited to sign my cast. Breaking your arm in school apparently makes you pretty popular when you're 10. Anyways, that was a little story about my psycho aunt. Sorry if it's all over the place and not very well written. I'm hyped up on coffee and I'm attempting to type on my laptop with fake nails. I hope y'all are having a fabulous day. Have you ever broken an arm or a leg or had to get stitches? Please let me know. Don't want to do your chores, son? Have fun being stuck at home. Backstory. After I had graduated from high school and still hadn't found my calling, my parents told me I could live with them rent-free as long as I did one very important thing, helped out with the chores, don't bring any girls or friends home after 9pm and occasionally offer to help with the groceries for the week. The lead up. It had been about 3 months and for the most part I was adhering to the second and third rule I was given. That all changed when I met my first lady friend. We'll call her Roxy cause she was a pretty bad chick. Now Roxy was a super bad influence on me and she started getting me to stay out late, spend most of my paychecks on getting us booze and such. I started slipping down a wormhole to which I almost wouldn't have returned from. My dad from time to time would remind me, hey son, you need to make sure you're helping with the chores and mind throwing 50 bucks towards groceries this week? Kind of reminders. That all changed after three months of being out of school and about a month and a half total of me knowing Roxy. We had come home from a concert in another city. For anyone who's my almost old fart age, it was a concert for Papa Roach and she told me that she was too tired to go home and she wanted to crash with me at my parents' home. The time, 2.30 a.m. We pulled up to the driveway and I told her to be quiet. Of course she wasn't, cause it was Roxy. Soon as we step inside the house and I've just locked the door, she starts screaming the chorus line from Twisted Sisters, We're not gonna take it, at the top of her lungs. Like clockwork, my parents' light comes on and my dad comes out of his room like a cheetah. A cheetah, I tell you. 
He sees us both and looks back in his room. Turning his head around, he goes, Take her home. Now. I immediately turn around and take Roxy home. She's all upset and tells me I should stand up to my old man, yada yada yada. Soon as we get her home, I know I can't go home, so I stay at her apartment with her. The next morning, there's a text on my phone. Come home at your earliest convenience. Love, Dad. I know I'm dead because A, my dad never texts me, and B, if he does text me, he's more of a John Madden play-by-play kind of guy. What I mean is, he's going to give you a paragraph of words for what could have been a single sentence or two. I kiss Roxy goodbye for what I'm sure is the last time I'll see another human being and head home. When I get home, he's sitting at the table with a pen and a piece of paper in front of him. He then tells me to sit down and then puts the piece of paper in front of me. The paper is an actual itemized list. He tells me that for the last month and a half, I haven't done any of my chores and that he's calculated, based on the roughly four to five hours a weekend of time I've wasted for him that amounts to his pay, which was $25 an hour, he's a registered nurse. So he's taken four hours times six weekends times 25 per hour pay and figured that I need to pay him $600 for time wasted. Then he's also, for good measure, throwing in an extra $100 for the two times he's asked me for $50 bucks to help out towards groceries. He gets up and walks over and says there's a dotted line for me to sign stating I will pay all of this back in one month's time. I'm adding it all up in my head and tell him I barely have a thousand bucks after taxes a month. He says I should have thought about that before I brought a girl home at 2.30 in the morning. He tells me if I don't sign this paperwork, I have 30 minutes to get my crap and get the heck out. I legit almost start bawling and tell him that I want to sign the paper, but could I at least have a month extension? He puts his hand to his chin, thinking, and then looks down at me and agrees. He says, you have two months to pay me 600 bucks. Oh, and by the way, he purposely hangs this in the air for a good 20 seconds. If you don't pay and you continue to break my three simple rules, there will be pain in your future. He revises the contract he's wrote up on the paper and I sign it. So a month and a half goes by and I've managed to pay him 450 bucks. I haven't seen Roxy as much over the two months because for obvious reasons, her cash pit has dried up a bit. She then calls me on day 45 and tells me that she misses me. She wishes we would hang out. Why I'm working so much overtime. I've told her that I have to pay my dad back or get kicked out. Of course, she ends up ending the call shortly after that, and then it happens. She texts me the next day about a show in another city. I hear all the usual. Oh, it's a band I really, really like. I've been wanting to see them forever. Plus, I miss snuggling up to you at the concert. I somehow stupidly agree to go with her. Well, while we were up there, my wallet gets stolen out of my front pocket. To this day, I think Roxy did it even though I've never been able to prove it. We go home, I drop Roxy off, and a few days go by. My dad comes knocking on my door as it's now officially day 55. He asks me, do I want to pay him the last 150 or wait till the two months are officially up? I tell him I got him and that I'll go to the bank right now seeing as I just got paid the day before. I look around my room for my wallet, nowhere to be found. I go find the jeans I wore at the concert I was at with Roxy, no wallet in there either. It's worth knowing I had and still have a terrible habit of leaving my wallet and my jeans after I take them off and forgetting that for several days. I start panicking as I cannot find my wallet anywhere. I check everywhere around the house, backyard, my car, I even call the last place I was at work and see if they might have it. No one's seen my wallet. I go back to my dad who's in the backyard cutting the grass and tell him what's going on. He gives me a half grin and says, sorry for your situation but I'm treating you like a tenant now. Go to the bank, get my money, and when you come back, pay me the 150. We'll go from there. I haul off to the bank and my heart about falls out of my chest as the teller tells me my account has a balance of $3.42. My heart drops to the ground. Worth noting here, it was a local bank that I've banked with since I was around 13. I was 18 at the time, so they all knew me at the bank and with some quick verification gave me info on my account. I head back home and tell my dad what happened. He puts his hand on my shoulder and says, Ah, that sucks. Well, you know I'm going to have to get my 150 bucks still, right? I tell him there's no way to have the money to him in five days or less. He says, Okay, well how about I drive you to work, seeing as you don't have a driver's license right now. 
He drives me to work, to which I'm there for roughly eight hours. The Revenge While at work, my dad pulled out his massive collection of craftsman tools and proceeds to drain all the fluids in my car. He gets a buddy to come over and help completely remove my motor, my transmission, and my tires. My dad and his buddy, being a master mechanic, managed to do all of this in an 8-hour shift of me being at work. At the end of my 8-hour shift, my dad is in the parking lot waiting for me. He's in his work overalls, which I find funny, and he's got grease all over his arms. He drives me home, and I notice my car is pulled into the garage and on jack stands. I look at my dad and ask, What's up with my car? He points to the garage. Oh, go ahead and see. I've got my 150 bucks today. I jump out of the car as it goes into park and run over to my car. There's a note on the front of it from my dad's mechanic friend stating the motor, transmission, and tires have all been sold to him for 150 bucks and that he'll happily not only give me back the items, but that he'll help me install them back into my car, but that I have to work for him on my two days off for the next four weeks from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. I fall over crying, obviously, and after my dad laughs a bit, tells me my first shift starts tomorrow. It is further worth noting that my dad actually owned this vehicle and it was titled, tagged, and licensed in his name, so technically he could do whatever he wants with it. He had just chosen to allow me to use the vehicle as mine. I would spend the next four weeks working with my dad's mechanic friend on my days off. After two days of working, we'd bring a few pieces of my car back to the house and he'd teach me how to put these items back together. I slowly but surely learned how to be my very own mini do-it-yourself garage mechanic. This may not fit here and my dad did pro-revenge me because shortly after I lost my car, Roxy dumped me and all of the things my dad took six months out of my life to teach me how to be a somewhat responsible adult. Oh, and the icing on the cake. Soon as we had my car back together and running, my dad walked up to me and gave me an envelope with 450 bucks in it and a note that said, stop being a knucklehead. Edit. My dad could be tough at times, but he's always been fair. Nothing, and I repeat, nothing he ever did was unwarranted. I was for a time living rent-free as an adult, and all he asked was for me to help clean the bathrooms, vacuum the rooms with carpets, not bring girls or friends home all hours of the night, and help out with groceries every once in a while. As an adult, I honestly deserved way worse than what I got. Heck, the adult 37-year-old me would have kicked my 18-year-old self out and said, Get out of my house, you ungrateful jerk. The Hot Sauce Donut Revenge This is a little short story from two years ago when my aunt still lived with me and my mom. Now, my aunt would constantly take food that I specifically bought for myself or for my mom out of the fridge. Thing is, I told her that it was for me and my mom and I'd make notes for her and put them on the containers or packaging the food was in. Her excuse was, it's just food. If you have money to buy that food, you have money to buy more. At the time, I was a waiter at a sushi restaurant. It was a good paying job with great staff and boss, but I didn't have money to spend like it's going out of style. After I got enough money saved up, I bought mini fridges for me and my mom because she was having the same problem with my aunt. The disappearing food stopped after that, for a week, before my aunt started going into me and my mom's room. After another week of dealing with her crap, I got an idea. I went to the Tim Hortons after I was done working for the day and bought a dozen raspberry filled donuts as well as two large bottles of this super spicy hot sauce, brought them home and proceeded to eat all of the raspberry filling out of them. Then I filled them to the brim with the hot sauce. I then put them back in the box and put them in my mini fridge. The next day when I came home from work to my aunt drinking a 4 liter jug of milk, when she saw me she was livid. She started screaming at me and threw the box of donuts at me. I looked at all of the donuts on the floor and one of them had a big bite taken out of it. When I saw that, I started laughing my butt off. Then my mom came downstairs. She asked what was going on and I explained to her about the hot sauce. Then she started laughing with me. My aunt yelled at me. How can you do this to your family? I said, I told you not to eat the food I bought and you wouldn't listen. Then you go into our rooms and eat our food after we told you not to? So I taught you a lesson not to take without asking. My aunt stormed off and didn't talk to me for a week, which I didn't mind at all. And let's just say she never took food from our mini fridges again. Entitled girlfriend wanted something shiny for her birthday. This was 15 years ago. 
Back then, I was dating a girl who turned out to be much more than she let on at first. I had been dating this girl for five months and things were going great. We hung out a lot and I got to say, I really enjoyed her company. She wasn't just a girlfriend, she was someone I really liked chilling with. Her birthday was coming up and I really wanted to do something awesome for her. She had told me a couple of times how much she wanted to go to a hockey game at the Bell Center to see a Montreal Canadiens game. I figured this was the best opportunity to see that she finally gets to go. After asking around, I was able to get tickets to see the Montreal Canadiens play against the visiting Pittsburgh Penguins. At that time, two of their most famous players were on the team. So not only would she get to see a Canadiens game, she would also get to see two of the most famous players at the time live. The day of her birthday comes, so we go out for dinner. After dessert, I hand her an envelope with a thoughtful greeting card I knew she would like, along with the game tickets. She rips the envelope open, not even reading the greeting card, holds up the hockey tickets, and disappointedly asks, What's this? I then explain to her how she's always wanted to go see a hockey game and how the Pittsburgh Penguins would be the visiting team and how I got some really good seats a few rows up behind the players bench, how I spared no expense. She was not impressed in the slightest. I appreciate the thought, but this is the kind of gift I would expect to get any other day. This is my birthday. I expected something shiny. I paused for a moment because I honestly thought she was trolling me or just wanted to make me sweat for a second, but no she was dead serious. She shoved the tickets into her purse and then told me that she would give me a chance to make it up to her. You're probably thinking that she was right to be disappointed because hey, hockey tickets, right? Well, truth be told, in Montreal, a night at a Canadian's hockey game is by no means a cheap date. The tickets themselves went for $350 for the pair. Montreal loves its hockey team and tickets are hard to come by. This drives up the price. Not to mention these were great seats. The cost of parking is astronomical, not to mention the cost of anything from the concessions is a pure rip. I kid you not, four hot dogs, two fries, and two cokes goes for like $50 Canadian. So adding it all up, it's a very expensive night of about $450 to $500. From then, the relationship took a hard left turn. Her attitude changed. She wasn't the same person anymore. I was truly turned away by her lack of appreciation of the gift and truly, I started giving less and less of a crap. I broke it off with her and I was upset that it was over. Up until the birthday fiasco, things were amazing and I truly believed she would be the one. Two weeks go by, I get a call from her mother. It seems that she liked me from the couple of times she and I met. She seemed to be genuinely concerned about how things went bad between her daughter and I, so we talked for a bit. This is how I got to understand where my ex-girlfriend's sense of entitlement came from. She asked me if I was doing okay. I replied honestly that I was upset and hurt that things turned bad and how I was happy until things changed. I expressed my disappointment at her reaction towards the gift. She asked whether I would go back with her if things would be as they were in the beginning, to which I said yes. If you want her back, you need to show how much you love her. Get her a ring. She will take you back if you do that. I felt as if I had suddenly sobered up from a night of partying, instant clarity. I conjured up all my willpower to keep myself from telling her to forget herself and to take her daughter with her. I simply replied with, thank you for wanting to help me with this. I have a lot to think about. I will surely be speaking to you soon. I ended the call. It took me a few days to let all that anger boil away. Insane Karen at my sushi restaurant. For context, I work at a sushi restaurant. We don't get a lot of entitled people, but we do get a couple every now and again, and I have a good handful of stories. This happened two years ago, a couple weeks after I went from a dishwasher to a waiter. Cast, we've got me, nice dad, nice son, Karen, and the manager. So it was around 8 p.m. when nice dad, nice son, and Karen walked in, confirmed their reservation, and sat down. I came over, and as they were looking at the menu, me, hello, my name is me, I'll be your waiter today. Would you like me to get your drinks first? They all ordered Coke. Me. Would you like me to bring glasses to pour your drinks into? Karen. No. You don't use glasses to drink soda? To nice dad. What a stupid question. And just from that one sentence, I could tell she was going to give me a rough night. Me. I'm sorry for asking. I'll get your drinks now. I was about to walk away when nice dad spoke up. Actually, I'll have a glass. Nice son said he wanted a glass as well. Karen looked angry when they said they wanted glasses. 
So after 10 minutes, I went to go take another table's drink order. I came back with the drinks and glasses. As I gave them their stuff, Karen was just complaining to Nice Dad about how long it took for me to get their drinks. Me to Karen. I'm sorry, but I went to go take another table's order. Well, you're supposed to be our waiter. You shouldn't be waiting on other tables. I then explained to her that I'm not just their waiter and I'm allowed to wait on as many tables as I want. Me. Now, before you all order, do any of you have any allergies I should know of? Nice Dad said he didn't have any, but said his son had peanut allergies and Karen said she had allergies to seafood and fish. Not sure why she would come to a sushi place when she's allergic to seafood and fish, but I shouldn't judge. I asked them what they wanted to order. Nice Dad had a viper roll, eel roll, and the sashimi platter for him and Nice Son. Nice Son had a California roll, and Karen had a caterpillar roll. California roll topped with avocado. Me to Karen. Since you're allergic to seafood, I'll make sure they use imitation crab meat for your roll. Fine, whatever. I walked over to the kitchen, told them the allergies and orders, then went to go wait on the other table. I glanced over at Karen and she looked angry at me. After 15 minutes, most of their food was ready. I brought it to them and Nice Dad asked me where the sashimi platter was. I told him that it would be a few more minutes and apologized for the inconvenience. I went back to the kitchen and got the other table's order, then got their sashimi platter. I walked over and was giving them the platter when Karen said this. Well, finally. I can't wait to try some sashimi. I quickly pulled the platter away. Ma'am, you said you were allergic to seafood and fish. So? You said you would use imitation fish. Yeah, I said that, but I said I would make sure they'd use imitation crab meat for your sushi roll. Everything else is real fish because they aren't allergic. She began to scream at me for trying to poison me. As Nice Dad tried to tell her to shut up and Nice Son was silently sitting there. We had everyone's attention. After a couple minutes, she says a Karen's catchphrase. I want to speak to your manager. After she said that, my manager walked out because another waiter got him. She then began screaming at him about how I was starving them, how I tried to poison her and was spewing offensive names towards me that I will not write down. The manager looked at me and simply said, So, what actually happened here? I told him that when I brought them the sashimi platter, Karen said she was going to eat some even though she said she was allergic to seafood and fish and when I wouldn't let her, she started screaming at me. I even showed him the receipt and at the bottom it says, customers are allergic to seafood, fish and peanuts. Manager just stood there silently until I finished talking, then turned to Karen. Ma'am, I'm going to have to ask you to leave. To nice dad. You can stay since you haven't done anything wrong. He's lying. Manager, we have cameras. Do I have to look at the footage? Fine, come on, let's just leave. We don't need this crappy restaurant or their crappy food. Nice Dad just looked at her with an angry stare. Nice Dad, go wait in the car. We're staying and finishing dinner. Karen began screaming at Nice Dad and manager threatens to call the police. Luckily, the police didn't need to be called because she left without any more problems. I finally gave them the sashimi platter and Nice Dad apologized to me for what Karen did. When I got the bill, I got a huge tip from Nice Dad. The next day when we came into work, manager told us that Karen was banned from the restaurant and if we saw her inside the restaurant to get him and he would call the police for trespassing. She hasn't been back since. I still work there, but she is still the dumbest customer I've ever dealt with over the past four years I've worked there. I have some more stories about the Karens that come into the restaurant and I'll upload them in a bit. Give me your Netflix that you don't have. I got a random message from someone I have never met before. And that person is horrible at lying. Entitled Mom. Hi. Me. Uh, hi? Do I know you? No, but we could be friends. So, do you have Netflix? Me. No. Well, can I use it? I don't have Netflix. Please, only for one year. I was like, bruh. Me. I don't have Netflix, I told you. But I have Disney Plus. Ew. What if I pay you for your Netflix? I don't have Netflix. Please, I need your Netflix real bad. Me, if you say that again, I will block you. Wow, so rude. You have to give me your Netflix now because of your rudeness. I don't have Netflix. You don't understand. My daughter wants to watch TV. Then get your own Netflix subscription. If you have money for a TV and a device that could text, then you could get a subscription easily. I am a single parent. 
Well, that changes everything. Like, totally. Entitled Mom, not realizing the sarcasm. Great! Send me the password and I'll give it back in a year or two. Me. I was joking. Entitled Mom. How dare you! I am a single parent of a 16-year-old girl and in need of money. Me. Well, then sell your gosh dang phone or whatever you're using. Do you have no sympathy for a destitute mother looking for a free Netflix? I don't have Netflix. And you don't want my Disney Plus, so what could I do? You could buy me a Netflix. I'm not paying a random person on the internet $9 a month. And I can't buy a Netflix account without my parents' permission. I'm 13, you idiot. I'm 13 as well. You are the worst liar ever. You have a daughter three years older than you? I adopted her, idiot. You adopted someone older than you? Does that mean I can have your Netflix? Then I blocked her. What would you rather have, Netflix or Disney Plus? Please let me know, I cannot wait to hear from you. Karen loses it when I ask her to control her kid. I was talking to an old friend I haven't heard from in ages and they brought up this story so I thought I'd share it. I used to work at Dillard's, so I saw my fair share of entitled behavior from our customers, but this incident happened to my coworker. A customer was browsing around with her four to five year old son. He was running around, knocking things off racks, etc. The mother made no effort to control him until he crashed into her a couple of times. She told him to go sit in one of the chairs by the dressing rooms. The chairs were pretty nice and upholstered in a silk-like fabric. My coworker was removing garments left in the changing rooms and as she passed by the boy, she noticed he was pushing a small car, think matchbox style car, all over the back of the chair and it was shredding the fabric. She spoke to him and asked him not to do that. He responded by blowing a raspberry at her and pushed the car with even more force. She went to the mother and said, your son is destroying the chair with his little car. Could you speak to him? Which is way nicer than I would have put it. The mother stopped and stared at my coworker. They stood there just looking at each other, which my coworker described as too long and very awkward. Finally, the mother asked, So? My coworker started saying, Well, could you? And before she could finish the sentence, the single mother knocked her across the face with the hanger she was holding. So hard, it broke the hanger. My coworker just turned around and went to find our manager. She first encountered an off-duty police officer who worked security in the store and is a close friend of mine and told him what had happened. He went with her to the manager. The manager went over to the mother, listened to her rant, apologized to her for the misunderstanding and gave her a 10% discount for her troubles. My coworker was so stunned she couldn't even speak. Even the cop was just saying, what the heck just happened? The cop turned to my coworker and asked if she wanted to press charges. Before she could answer, the manager interrupted, saying that wouldn't be necessary. Meantime, all the other employees in the department are watching all this go down and I had just walked back in for my break. I see my coworker has a huge mark across her face. My coworker told the cop she did in fact want to press charges. The manager told her she couldn't do that if she wanted to keep her job. She told him that was fine. She quit. The manager was still insistent that the mother not be troubled by all this. The cop said she could have put her eye out and I am arresting her. If you don't like it, you can take it up with my commander. The entitled mother was still acting smug until she saw the cuffs. Then she started screaming the usual nonsense. I'm gonna sue all of you. I'll have your badge. Do you know who I am? Etc. No one but the manager cared and she still went to jail. All of the other employees and customers who were watching clapped as she was being led out of the store in cuffs. The manager started in on the employees about how to correctly deal with situations like what had happened. We all looked at each other and without saying a word, we all clocked out and left. All of us. Good luck running the entire department by yourself. We hung around our injured coworker until she was done with the police report and then took her to lunch. She said she had been planning to apply at a different store in the same mall anyway, but hadn't planned on quitting the way it happened and worried that Dillard's would give her a bad reference now. We convinced her to go to the other right then, injured face and all. She explained what happened to the manager there. She was hired on the spot and told they don't put up with crap like that. If a customer hits you, no matter who they think they are, charges will be filed and will be permanently banned from the store. I spoke to my cop friend a few days later 
and he said the crazy woman nearly drove him insane with her screaming and threats on the way to jail, which wasn't close. After she saw that wasn't working, she started with pleading and bribery. He said he didn't think he had ever been so glad to hand someone off to booking. All this happened ages ago, and since that day, I've never stepped foot in a Dillard's. Entitled Roommate Gets What He Deserves Background 1992, I'm a sophomore at a very large university in a southwest desert state. I'm living in the dorms with a jerk of a freshman roommate. At the time, I'm an engineering major, which means a lot of science and a lot of math classes. I also work about 25 to 30 hours a week because I'm putting myself through school. The scholarship only covers tuition and housing, but not books, food, or pretty much anything else I might need. My job is on campus, and since I was the new guy, my shifts were basically 4 to 10 p.m. with the occasional all-day Saturday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. My work was pretty much answering phones and dispatching technicians until 7 p.m., and then it turned into a computer helpline of sorts for the unsupervised terminal labs on campus. Frequently, there was nothing to do, so I spent a lot of time doing homework and playing X-Tank with other students across campus. Jerk Rumi, though, is a business major, with the quotation marks and everything, which in the early 90s was basically the same as undecided, so his class load was things like Sociology 101 and World History 101. If they had offered Underwater Basket Weaving 101, he would have signed up for it. My classes were spread out around campus, but having had my bike stolen the previous year, I got around campus on rollerblades. My math class, ODE, was held two buildings from my dorm, so that was just a short walk away. Like most major research universities, the majority of my classes were taught by teaching assistants, TAs. The Incident I came back to the dorm late after working an extra long shift. I had an ODE midterm the next morning at 8 a.m., so I set my alarm for 7 a.m. to be able to get up, get dressed, and have a quick bite before class. My ODE class was unusual in that the TA decided that he was going to have two tests and no graded homework for the entire semester. The midterm was 40% of the grade and final was 60. I had been studying for this midterm for the past couple of weeks, doing all the optional homework assigned while at work, so I felt pretty confident I would get a pretty high grade on it. Jerk Rumi was not there, and I didn't expect him there as it was midweek. His fraternity didn't usually start partying until Friday night. I took the opportunity to make sure I had everything ready on my desk before jumping in the shower and going to sleep. I awake the next morning to a ton of noise outside the door. I'm thinking, what the heck? I look over and Jerk Rumi is sound asleep. The room stinks and there's an empty bottle in the trash. I look over at my clock, thinking it's like 5 in the morning, and it is completely off. I start to panic and throw open the curtains. Bright sunlight greets me. Students are leaving the building in droves with their backpacks, bikes, etc. It dawns on me. It's gotta be close to 8 a.m. I rush over to my closet and check my watch. It's 8.15. Jerk Rumi starts to whine. Close the curtains. What the heck did you do? I yell at him. What are you talking about? He groggily asks. My alarm. What did you do to it? Oh, I turned that thing off. It was too loud, and I don't have class until 11. You jerk! I have an 8 a.m. I quickly got dressed, grabbed a couple of pencils and my calculator, grabbed my shoes, and ran out the door, looking like crap, but hoping I could make it in time and have some time left for the midterm. It took me five minutes to sprint to the building and up one flight to the classroom. I barge in, and the TA gives me a look. I quickly explained that my roommate turned off my alarm, but I'd still like to take the midterm and the remaining time left, and I'll take whatever grade I get, knowing that 40% of any points is better than zero. TA leans back in his chair and smiles. No. Huh? I must not have heard him right. I ask him to explain what he means. No. You're more than 15 minutes late for class. I'm not allowing you to take the test. I basically beg him in front of the entire class to let me take it, because of circumstances that were not my fault. He gives this big smile and says, I said no. That's the end of it. Maybe next time you'll consider my time and be on time for my class. I'm literally shaking at this point. I'm so mad. I say in a loud voice, Fine. I'm not setting foot in your class again until the final. And then I'm going to ace your final and make you graded in front of your professor. He laughs and tells me he'll see me in May. 
I Storm Out. The Revenge Part 1 Jerk Rumi was the first to get his. I just had to wait for the right moment. That moment didn't take too long. It was a campus rule that students under 21 were not allowed to drink in the dorms. Jerk Rumi had the same pattern every time he brought a girl over. He always put rubber bands on the doorknob to let me know he had company. The next time the rubber bands were on the door, I waited until I could hear them. Then I went and got the wing's resident assistant and claimed I had locked myself out and left my key on my desk. My resident assistant was a by-the-book Navy ROTC cadet, so he made me fill out the appropriate paperwork and then went to unlock the door. It was glorious. That was the last I ever saw of Jerk Rumi. Jerk Rumi's parents showed up the following week to gather his things. I didn't say a word to them, just put on my headphones and continued studying. Resident assistant told me later that he was expelled from the university for violations of code of conduct. One down, the TA was next. The Revenge Part 2 Now every student has an advisor to help with class selection and sign off on things like grade replacement options or prerequisites. Normally, your advisor is in the same college as your degree, so technically, my advisor should have been from the College of Engineering. However, my advisor, Dr. Ald, was a family friend and a former high school football teammate of my dad's. When I was accepted at the university, he called and offered to be my advisor, even though he was in a different department. So, my first visit was to him to see what could be done about the TA. He agreed with me that the TA's actions were reprehensible, but quite honestly, the TA had the ability to deny me the chance to take the exam after showing up so late if it was in the syllabus. I asked him if he could find out who this guy's professor was so I could at least make sure that my final exam was graded fairly. I was more afraid that even if I aced the exam, he would lie and say I didn't. Dr. Old agreed that should be doable under the circumstances, so he said he'd ask around. I then studied my butt off for the next couple of months, going to tutoring sessions and doing almost every single homework problem in the book. I spent a lot of late nights at work reviewing and re-reviewing the problems and sample exams in the book. Dr. Old, during that time, got back to me and said he had found the professor in question and that the professor was willing to take the time to grade the exam. Then he told me that there was one other thing pertinent to the incident. This TA was definitely done for. Final exam. I showed up 30 minutes early, sat in the front row, dead center across from the TA's desk. Two pencils, calculator, and three sheets of blank paper for scratch paper and nothing else. No backpack, no notebook. We had to turn in all scratch papers as part of the exam to ensure that no one cheated or pre-wrote formulas or example problems on them. When he showed up, he was surprised to see me there waiting patiently. I told you I'd be here. The stare I gave him made him uncomfortable. I finished relatively early, which he noticed. He asked if I was going to hand in my exam. Not right now, at the end. When the last student finished and left, I stood up with him. I know you have received an email from Professor Young and your instructions are to bring the exam to him for grading. That got his attention. I am going to be walking with you to the math building right now to take this exam to him because I don't trust that you won't try to switch my exam with someone else's or lose it on the way. T.A. shrugs, gathers the rest of the exams, and walks out. We make it over to the math building, up to the 8th floor. I head to the math department conference room. The T.A. says, You're going the wrong way. Nope, I say. You're meeting Professor Young in here. Sure enough, Dr. Old and Professor Young are sitting at the conference table chatting up a storm. On the table in front of them was the class syllabus. The T.A., seeing this, gave me a look over his shoulder. Instead, I politely greeted Dr. Old and sat down next to him. Professor Young introduced Dr. Old as the math department head to TA, then asked me if I had the exam, which I handed him. He asked the TA for the answer key and then began grading. I sat silently. The TA fidgeted a lot, and Dr. Old double-checked the answers. Verdict, 100%. My D was assured. The TA got a smug look on his face. So, you passed the class after all. Congratulations. Actually, it doesn't matter. Dr. Old already signed the paperwork for me to retake this class in the summer as a GRO, no matter what the outcome here was. Grade replacement option, GRO, classes could completely replace the previous grade of an F or D in a class as if you had never taken the previous course, so the previous bad grade didn't count in your GPA. However, back in the early 90s, you could only do so three times in a student's academic career. 
You needed the sign-off of your advisor as well. By 1992, most every student at the university knew the procedure. GRO, says the TA. Then he gets this hunted look as it dawns on him that Dr. Old is actually my advisor. He glances over at Professor Young, who is holding the copy of the syllabus. So, TA, says Professor Young, can you show me where in your syllabus it says that students will be prevented from taking any exam if more than 15 minutes late? Because that's not university policy. And it's certainly not this department's policy, chimed in Dr. Old. TA grabs the syllabus and starts scanning it front and back, then slowly lets it drop back to the table. It's not in there, sir, he said. So, by denying this student the ability to take the midterm, you've violated departmental policy and academic policy then, replied Professor Young. If I recall correctly, this student begged you to allow him to take the midterm and said he would accept whatever grade he received for the limited time remaining in the class. Is that substantially correct? Yes, sir. Both Dr. Old and Professor Young turned to me. I think you should probably leave at this point, said Dr. Old. We're going to finish this up and then discuss some personal matters. I'll call you later. So I got up and left. I'd be lying if I said I didn't do a little mini dance in the elevator on the way back down. I got an email a week later from Dr. Old confirming my GRO class registration, along with a note saying that the TA had been fired for violations of university policy. He implied that the TA's graduate academic work was in serious jeopardy as well, as the university would most likely not allow him to transfer and continue on his master's work to another institution. The icing on the cake was that the TA, being fired for cause, could not get another TA position at any of the state's three universities and did not have the means or the time to look elsewhere. So his student visa was revoked and he had to return to his northern European country. And yeah, I aced the summer class too, but this time I wasn't late for anything. Cousin demands my PS3 account. Backstory. My uncle and cousin are actually very nice people, but occasionally they can be quite entitled. I recently went to their state to pay them a visit. The other day, my grandparents sent me a text saying that my cousin wanted to talk. I thought this was odd because we never talked. Onto the story. The cast. We've got me. We've got my mom. We've got entitled cousin. And we've got entitled uncle. Entitled cousin. Hi, is this OP? Me. Yes, I haven't seen you in a while. What did you want to talk about? I don't know. Well, I heard you just got into fourth grade. Do you like it? No. Why not? I have to learn. Me, containing laughter. Well, that's understandable. Entitled cousin. Do you have an X cube? No, sorry. Oh, you have a PZ4, don't you? Yeah, and I have a PZ3. What's your username? I give him an account name that's not my actual account. Okay, I'll friend you when I get home. I'll call you back. He hangs up. He calls back. What's your password? Me. Sorry? Do you mean my username? No, I mean your password. I want to use your account. <laughs> Me. Sorry, but no. I have money on that account and I'm very protective over anything that I have money on. Please. I don't have any fun games on my PS3 and you say that yours is fun. So why can't I just use yours? Because, like I said, I have money on the account and I really don't trust anyone with it. Well, I'm your cousin. You can trust me. Me. Sorry, but I don't even really trust my other siblings with it. If you want money on your account, you can ask your dad. But he said you would give me money. So can you just transfer money to my account? Sorry, but like I said before, I'm not going to do that. We can play together if you want, but I'm not going to give you any money. I hear him crying and running off somewhere. Entitled Uncle picks up the phone. My son said that you wouldn't let him play on your account. Why? Me. Because I have money on that account and I'm very protective of it. Well, he's your little cousin. He just wants to play your games. So what if he buys some? I have over $100 on that account and I'm saving it for when a certain game comes out so I can buy it and some in-game items. Uncle. Well, you can get more money another time. But right now, your little cousin wants to use your account, so just give him the password already. Me. Sorry, but like I said, no. It's my money, and I can do what I want with it. If he wants to spend money, why can't you give him some? Because I have better things to spend my money on, unlike games. I have a life and a job, something you don't. So just give Entitled Cousin the account already. I'm not going to continue talking about this. Don't make me get your mother. Me. 
Well, I already said no, and I'm very sure my mother would support me. Uncle, you are going to give my son your account now and put extra money on it just because of this. You don't have a choice. I'm an adult and you're a kid. Me. Well, you live halfway across the country, so how are you going to make me? Just give my son the account. I will not ask you again. You will also add an additional $150 because he deserves it more than you. Me. No. Uncle. That's it. I'm calling your mother, and she will give me all of your money, your PZ4 and your account password. You will also be grounded from electronics for the rest of your life. Proceeds to call my mom. Mom. Hi, I haven't talked to you in a while. What's up? Your son is being a brat and not letting my son play on his account. I want all of his money, his PZ4, and his account password. I also want him grounded from electronics for the rest of his life. Why aren't you responding? Respond now! Mom. While you were complaining, my son informed me of everything that happened and showed me the call. So you can shut up and never talk to my son again. My mom later gave me an extra $50 on the account just for sticking up to him. He always makes me such a pushover because I'm a nice person. I was actually going to give my cousin $10 because he deserves it. Yes, Entitled Kid actually does deserve something, until my uncle did that. Now I have my uncle and cousin blocked, and I haven't heard from them since. Karen goes crazy at the music store. This was a little while ago, so I'll be paraphrasing what was said, but I'll try my best to make it as accurate as possible. In the area I live in, there's probably two or three main music shops I know of, and two of which are in the same city a few streets from each other. This particular store I went to has no uniform, but some form of ID. I think it was an ID card around their neck, but haven't been there in a while, so I can't remember. At this time, I had been playing drums in school for about six months and decided I wanted to buy a drum kit for my house. This shop had the best prices, yada, 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 so I decided to go there. As soon as I walk in, I spotted a mother and father with a kid, probably three or four, walking around. I went up to an employee and asked for recommendations and, funny enough, they gave me a recommendation. I hadn't been on an electronic drum kit before, but he was listing all the pros to them and the cons, and after plugging headphones in, he let me play and see how I felt. I'm a big guy, at the time I was 17, and was going to the gym a lot. I was probably a little over 100 kilograms at this time, but it was a mix of fat and muscle. One of the pros of this drum kit was that everything was movable so anyone could play and not feel cramped. Very useful for me. About two minutes in, I saw the mother, clearly the alpha of the family, marching towards me. I paid no attention. I was looking for a kid and maybe they were just on the way over here too. She stopped a meter away from me, crossed her arms and tapped her foot. I stopped playing, took one headphone off and the following conversation happened. Me. Hello? Entitled mom. Where would the best guitars be? Me. I'm not actually entitled mom cuts me off. You don't know? How would an employee not know? Me. I don't work here. She seemed unfazed by this info. Get me your manager, now. This is unacceptable behavior and a bad way of treating a customer. I just stared at her, almost dumbfounded at how she mistakes me for an employee. Sure, they had no uniform, but I wasn't wearing anything to ID myself as an employee. I'm pretty sure the dad knew I wasn't an employee, but was too afraid to even challenge her. I should also point out, I look much older than I am. I'm also rather hairy and have a badly kempt beard. Me. I do not work here. Entitled mom. Do not lie to me. I know you work here, and I'll have you fired for this. I know the owner. I clearly displayed on my face my amusement. I started smiling, trying to control my laughter. Big mistake. She starts screeching at the top of her lungs, shouting and pointing at me, shouting about how I'm done and that I'm a bad employee. Actual employees came to calm the situation down a bit. I just sat back down and kept playing, and she kept shouting that I should be fired. She was eventually calmed down and taken to a separate part of the store. Now, I thought this is where it would end, and that I had a funny story to tell my friends and a memory to laugh at, but no. I decided not to get this version of the drum kit, but get a more advanced, upgraded version, which they didn't have in stock. The other store, a few streets away, did. So I quickly walked there, asking for assistance and the same general process as before happened. I sat down, and as I was putting the headphones on, she walks in, demanding to see the guitar section. And to my luck, it was right beside me. 
I played as normal, testing out the features and feeling the way it plays. The dad lifts the guitar, despite it saying to ask for an employee to help, and hands it to the son, who instantly drops it. In my attempt not to laugh, I fake coughed and looked away, but she had heard. She turns on her heel and... Do you know how rude? Why are you here? Me. Don't work here either. I did as any normal, sane person would do. Assume it's coincidence and move on. She, following the path of being senile, assumed I was obviously following her and harassing her. Entitled mom. You followed us here. Me. I was here first. This clearly didn't matter as she called for security. Two guys, smaller than me, came over and asked if there was a problem. And before I could open my mouth, she said, Yes, he is harassing us. Smirking and smugly looking at me. At this point, I realized it could get serious. I stood up and said, Me. Check the security footage. I came in here first and didn't even talk to her. She approached me. The two guys, knowing I had come in first, said to her it'll be investigated. She was having none of this, and as expected, screaming, shouting, and flailing ensued. I turned to one of the guys and explained what had happened at the other store, and he brought me away and sorted out with a drum kit. In short, forget that jerk. Accusing a large built guy of this stuff could have went completely south and got me in serious trouble, but thankfully nothing came from it. I didn't believe people like this actually existed, but now I feel sorry for those who deal with them on a daily basis. Brofis to all those who deal with crazies every day. Karen needs a rental car. I own a gift shop in a hotel. The hotel has a car rental agency two doors down. This agency closes at 6 p.m. The time is now 7.10. Karen walks to my door, not through it. She's standing in the corridor and proceeds to ask, nicely enough, if I knew where a car rental agency is. I told her two doors down, but the guys left already and that they close at 6. She huffs and goes over there, I presume to bang on the locked door until someone magically appears. She comes back, I have a customer, a hotel guest, who is from out of town and is here learning about our community from me, the now local tour guide. I didn't mind him at all, he was fun to talk with and liked my insider knowledge. She demands to know where another car rental place is, she still hasn't walked through my door. She barks at us that her company doesn't use the agency they put her in a hotel with. She doesn't like the other two big brand names in town and doesn't know much about number four. I tell her I don't rent cars. I live here, obviously, because I'm working. The guest I'm talking to tells her if she can't slash won't use the big name rental agencies, then her best bet would be to Google what's around here. I piped in that I don't believe we have any others besides the big four, as we're not an airport city or a tourist destination. She's dumbfounded by his suggestion saying her company would never pay for an off-brand rental company. He again suggested she just Google it and contact her company to figure out her particular situation. He even tosses out the bright side that most hotel guests know how to do, which is to just ask the front desk person and as a last resort, ask for the yellow pages. He gets frustrated because he ends up literally explaining how to use her phone and how to search Google. She huffs at him and says that we were useless and no help at all. His last words to her were, Who the heck doesn't know how to use Google? I'm 60 years old and I know I can just talk to the Google to get my info. Would you have helped Karen in this situation or just told her to get lost? I really want to know. My entitled mom tries to control my time. For as long as I can remember, mom has always been the first and final word in everything and if you started poking holes in her logic, using logic from that morning or the previous day, you were punished and this included house rules. I suppose some of the extremes she went to to try and discipline us was related to the fact that my brother Donald, who's just like Donald Duck, annoying, useless, but occasionally awesome, and I were smarter than average and found workarounds by obeying the letter of the rules but not their spirit because they were so arbitrary and served only to give her opportunities to steal from us from elementary school onward. We were going to get punished anyway, so what did it matter if we cheated a little? It was the time of dial-up internet and getting browsers in the mail as CDs and we got our first computer which gave her some leverage since we wanted to play games on it but she didn't want our schooling to suffer so she justifiably placed a time limit on non-school related activities on its use. Entirely reasonable, right? 
Well, we had to earn our time on the computer by doing chores instead of an allowance, which she seemed violently allergic to. What she never told us until it happened was that at any time she chose, we'd get our time taken away permanently, but we both found the sweet spot of her forgetfulness and reclaimed every last sweaty hard one second we were owed. Time goes on and we get a PlayStation 1 and the play limit extends there as well, but given it's my brother's system, there's now a twist. We each have our time, but I had to ask his permission to play, which he never gave because he was the golden child and the apple of my mom's eye. Had to go to dad to work around this since Donald blew his daily allowed game time as soon as he got home from school and I waited till after homework for mine. Mom didn't like this and tried to enforce the rule of asking Donald to which dad had my back and there was a screaming match in base housing over why their daughter had to ask permission from her younger brother to play a console that mom kept in the living room anyway because she didn't trust anyone not to sneak around her and play it. It was glorious. They fought a lot about things like that, but she always won since at the time my dad was active duty and she was always home. We coped with this inexcusable torment in different ways with Donald becoming her yes man and brown noser and preferential treatment and I sided with dad because even at that young age, I knew this crap was whack and I wasn't going to stand for it. It went on like this until college and she's carried on like she owned the time associated with any electronic devices and even forbade us from getting cell phones. She said because we weren't responsible enough, but it was about phone games. She couldn't reasonably keep us from playing outside the house on them and therefore couldn't deny us gaming time on one. Mom even went as far as to try to keep us from leaving the house on the weekends we were being punished just so we couldn't see our friends and potentially play games at their houses. She should honestly have tried a different punishment because she was living proof of insanity at that point, expecting us to stop taking advantage of her forgetfulness to get our time back. She hated it whenever I got dad involved to enforce the rules on Donald, who was as entitled as mom and was slightly immune to her attempts to limit game time. The screaming matches between our parents over her entitled hypocrisy led to cops being called and counseling was recommended, which to mom's credit we did as a family. Little changed, except that the therapist told mom she was being unreasonable and was going to stress herself to an early grave if she didn't ease up. Why didn't she try establishing a structured list of rules for the family anyway? Everyone in the family says you change everything at the drop of a hat when mad, so if the rules are written and followed, then there'd be less complaining and fighting, right? A month later, we have the result and honestly, it looked more like what parents set up for their second graders than a serious thing for a college student. Rules, concrete rules, rules she could only change if we all agreed to the change and most of the family anyway, with ironclad rewards and punishments. Donald and I grilled her for hours on the new rules, making sure we understood every line and that she understood that her BS about arbitrarily denying us time on any computer and console game was not a part of these rules and would not be tolerated. She kept whining about us making the introduction of the rules longer than it had to be, but she was slippier than a sea slug and we all wanted to know the ins and outs of this new way of living and its implications. The short of it was there was a daily list of chores that had to be done and missing something meant you had to draw from a colored stack of index cards for your punishment, which had a wild card to be any other card in the pile and a free card because sometimes you got away with things. Rewards were given for days without punishment and the bonus rewards at the end of a perfect week. The rewards were poker tokens that could be saved and cashed in for a set list of established rewards like an extra soda, extra time on a computer, etc. But if you could argue the case, they could have a $1 value towards something from a store. The plan was ultimately to have this phased out as we were all too old to do this for any extended period of time and some things were changed such as the soda reward being removed after Donald used his save tokens to buy a 12 pack of soda that he kept in his room so he wouldn't have to share. That rule was removed and the one about bonus game time was nearly removed as well, but I pointed out that I rarely used that one or the soda reward and mom hadn't gotten any family consensus to remove the soda perk. It was only her and dad. I refused to let another perk get the ax because she didn't like what Donald did and wasn't willing to keep him from abusing the system and punishing the rest of us because of his entitlement. She didn't like this at all and tried to undermine this new system 
by trying to use wild cards to take away our playtime, which was against the rules and she was not allowed to get away with that. Dad and I saw her chomping at the bit here and we knew this blessed system was living on borrowed time. This marked the beginning of her killing a system that everyone but her loved because of its structure, predictability, and clean-cut rewards and punishments. It protected us from her and we had all signed this faux agreement that stated we would follow and obey until a set date and time. It was slow at first, forgetting to give us our rewards tokens which dad was happy to dole out. She would tried to misplace the slips of paper we had our tokens count on because we were racking up quite a few at that point only to find that dad had a ledger of who had what since he too had a stack of reward coins and he knew what that moist bent was up to. I had to get a ledger that I hid in a torn stuffy because I'll be darned if she didn't try to find and get rid of anything used to track our accumulated rewards. Around this time, our internet provider announced a deal. If we got a brand new Wi-Fi router, we could get a deal on it and a month's accelerated bandwidth for half cost or upgrade to the next best router which required LAN cables. Dad, Donald and I were all excited at the thought of the wireless router as mom had tokens to turning off the internet to individual rooms after throwing a fit to have the router placed in the hot garage over her car. Not a good place for a router, but perfect for a vindictive, unemployed housewife on a power trip. Needless to say, we didn't get a Wi-Fi router and her behaviors just got worse towards the rule set that kept her in check before and her antics by unplugging LAN cables meant our schooling suffered as courses were migrating to incorporate online classwork. The therapist had given us a time frame to observe this rule set before phasing it out and we weren't even a quarter of the way through it when mom flipped her entitled crap one day and went storming down the hall to where I was perched on a chair in front of Donald's PS3 loading some game and she burst in like a bat out of heck, red in the face and steaming with a brown smear on her ankle. Abraxas, you didn't pick up all the dog's poop yesterday before you mowed the lawn and I got it all over my foot. You lost your game time. That's against the rules. Gotta make me draw a card, mom. Fine, have it your way. She stormed down the hall in all her waddling, limping glory and slammed my set of punishment cards down on the kitchen counter with a look of unfiltered joy on her face. We had all been marking our cards for months with various stains of sauces when cooking, so we knew what we were in for, and my top card was free, so I pulled it and showed it to her. Free? Well, that's not fair. Draw another. Sorry, mom but failing to pick up doggy dollops only requires one draw and you know there's a chance to draw the free card out of all 32 of them. I don't have to draw and it's against the rules. Mom turned a lovely shade of purple as I turned away and had my hour of playtime. This was the final nail in the coffin of the rule set and mom took all the reward tokens from everyone and threw them in the trash in front of dad who confronted her as it was against what the therapist had said and wasn't done with general consent. A shouting match ensued and it ended with dad pulling all the punishment cards and throwing them out with the tokens and dumping wet coffee grounds on the whole mess to ruin her precious index cards. Dad said that if she had solely decided to break the rules and disregarded the therapist's warnings about this kind of thing to stop having to reward good behavior, he was going to ruin the punishments so she couldn't arbitrarily punish people with a broken system. She eventually started screaming she was going to call the cops and tried to drag Donald and I around the house with her as a human shield despite dad having never been physical and she screeched to be left alone or she'd call the cops. It was like she thought we'd be okay with returning to the way things were before only with a lot more unpaid chores and requirements of us. She just couldn't let go of her own ego long enough to let the therapist approved system work and undo the damage she had caused for over 25 years and refused to admit she did anything wrong. I still remember to this day the dumbfounded look on her face when dad dumped the coffee on the pink, green, and white cards that she adored. To be honest, the system would have worked better for elementary kids, but she was too busy being an entitled control freak to let such a thought enter her thick head to entertain that maybe certified child therapists knew what they were saying at that time and she was messing us up from a young age with her BS. Nor did it cross her mind that it would take a lot more than seven months to undo said damage that had been ongoing since then along with everything else she caused us. Parking Garage Idiot Regrets His Decision I used to work for a large state agency and after five years had become a middle manager. My office was in the state office tower downtown 
and parking was scarce, but middle management and up got reserved parking in the garage attached to our building. This was a great perk since it is a cold state, and on days that the tower garage is full, you have to park at a private garage about a mile away and walk. One day I had to run a few errands and pulled up to the garage a little later than usual. By the time I had gotten there, the sign on the garage said it was full, but I had a badge that let me go in anyway and drive down to my reserve spot. There was a man at the gate who was trying to get in despite the sign that it was full. When I realized he didn't have a badge, I backed up a little and honked my horn to let him know he could back up. This infuriates him. He gets out of his car and flips me off and hurls a few choice words my way. As he backs up out of the spot, I pull up to the gate and he yells some more words my way about how stupid I am and that I can't read that the garage is full. I ignore him and assume he is just some guy there to have a meeting at one of the dozens or so agencies in our building and park my car. I get to my desk and get an email from HR that one of the upper managers was sick and that I needed to cover down on some interviews. Interviews in our agency start with a group of prospective employees working on a small project together and then the candidates sit in front of a panel individually. I walk into the room where all of these candidates are sitting and there I see him. Parking jerk. I was in my car so he didn't get a great look at me but I knew exactly who he was. The candidates introduce themselves and get to work on their small project. Parking jerk was trying to control the entire process but they successfully completed the project as a team. The panel then asks all of the candidates to go sit in the hall while we discuss and we would call them in individually when we were ready. Once they were all out of the room, I giddily told my coworkers about my interaction with Parking Jerk and they die laughing. We'd call him in first and begin asking him basic employment questions. He is otherwise a strong candidate but was very full of himself. The rest of the panel goes first. Finally, it's my turn. Me. How do you react to stress? Jerk. I handle it just fine. I'm a very level-headed person. Me. Come on, everyone gets a little flustered at some point. Jerk. Not me. Cool as a cucumber. Me. So you never do anything like get out of your car and yell at a stranger? Jerk is silent. Or call them names and tell them to learn how to read? Jerk's face goes white. Me. Do you realize this job puts you in front of the media frequently and someone who is always watching? Do you realize that if you were to work here, your actions would reflect on not just you, but they would reflect on your director, the department as a whole, and state government? Do you think that if you were in my position, you would hire someone who behaved as rudely as you did? Jerk hangs his head in shame. I think I may not be cut out for this position. Me. That doesn't necessarily mean you're a bad person, but you may not be ready for this job. He was deflated. I really think that this was the first time someone had held him accountable for his actions. He did not get that job, but a few years later, I saw him working for another agency, and by all accounts, he sounds like he had learned. The Woman with Two Wigs So me and my coworker, who is a good friend and fellow courtesy clerk, let's call her Ale, were working a 6 a.m. shift. As per usual with 6 a.m. shifts, we were just generally chatting, putting go-back items into their respective carts, preparing to place them back on their shelves. As I was doing so, I hear the low mechanical murmur of one of our motorized shopping carts coming up behind me. I step to the side to let the rider through, but notice that rider has stopped right next to me. I look over and notice. I had seen this woman a little earlier in my shift, but because she was at a distance before, I didn't give it much thought. But now that she was right beside me, I couldn't help but notice. This woman was wearing two wigs on her head, one blonde, one black. The blonde one was on her scalp, while the black one was messily thrown on top of the blonde. That and her demeanor, something felt off to me. She didn't seem to be under the influence or anything, something just didn't feel right. All right, that's new, but I still didn't want to make any assumptions. It's 6 a.m. after all. The woman looks at me and says, Hey you, follow me. And she starts riding her scooter to the door. I'm a bit taken aback by this. What could this woman want from me that requires me to head outside? Sure, it was a little past 6 a.m., but it was still winter. It was still dark outside. I glance at my coworkers. Ale seems just as confused as I am, but Mrs. P, one of the cashiers, was shaking her head, advising strongly not to follow. I look back at the woman who is now halfway to the door. She stops on the scooter and notices that I am not following. She motions with her hand and aloud, Come on! I'm not condoning what I do. I look back on this now and I still call myself dumb for it. I follow her partially. 
I had no intention of following her anywhere outside of the store, but I did follow her to the doorway. Once I reached there, I firmly plant my feet and refuse to move any further. I glance over to the security guard who is posted by the door. He's watching this interaction intently from the corner of his eye, which made me feel a lot better. The woman is now in the doorway as well, but this time when she looks back for me and sees where I am, she just accepts it, that I'm going no further than this. She then asks me to lean in just a bit closer because I have something to ask you that I don't want anyone else to hear. She really didn't want anyone else to hear either. As anyone who would walk by, she would stop and glare them down with a hard side eye. Once she was sure that no one else could hear, she asks, How do you want your hair done? I was a bit confused. Currently, I have no styles in my hair. I just wash it and put it in a ponytail. I'm not really looking for anything extravagant at the moment. Maybe just a nice press to get my hair a bit easier to manage again. So I awkwardly tell her as such. She stares for a moment and then points to one of her wigs. Do you want it like this? I, I really don't. I reiterate that I just want my hair done and out of the way so I don't have to focus on it for a while. I don't think she likes this response as she sort of glared at me and in a more sharp and whispered tone said, I'm trying to do something nice for you. I do a little nervous laughter, bad habit I can't help when I'm not sure how to respond. What's your name? She asked. And I mean, I can't lie about it. It's right there on my name tag. Uh, Imapso. Imapso. Alright, I'll remember that. I won't forget. I'll remember that. I got something for you. I'll bring it to you next month. Be looking out for it. She starts to drive off, and as she's going out the door, she keeps mumbling loudly. Let somebody mess with you. Just let somebody mess with you. As though she were threatening somebody. I walk back to my coworker and tell them what happened, but it doesn't quite end there. A little while later, I was in an aisle putting things back on the shelves, when I look over and happen to see the same lady riding by on her scooter passing the aisle I was working at. I had thought she was finished, hence why she left earlier, but she passed my aisle at least a few times. This had been enough to put me on edge initially, and I had tried to stay out of her sight until I was sure she had left. As it turns out, she's a semi-regular customer, coming in on random occasional intervals. Some coworkers have seen her, others haven't. And there was an instance where I saw her a few weeks ago while I was pushing in carts. She wouldn't have noticed or seen me because I was wearing my scarf around my face and a hood to cover my head. This story comes to mind because this month is the month that she supposedly brings me something. I'm honestly not sure what it could be, but my guess is that it could be a wig. If she was serious about bringing me something. Let me know what you guys think it could be because I'm curious. And of course, if she does bring me the thing, I will update you guys. So what do you think she's going to bring OP? Please let me know. Take out tip trouble. I am a server at an Asian restaurant in Michigan. We are busy all year round, but especially during the high tourist season of June through September. I've worked there about two and a half years. This business does a great amount of takeouts. In the last two years, the only two other Asian restaurants in this town have closed and takeout has exploded front of the house is expected to answer phones and take orders and also cash takeout orders out if slash when we have a chance. Taking orders itself deserves combat pay. We will regularly field calls from people who are not familiar with our type of cuisine and need to be walked through the menu. Or people who decide to wait until they place the call to ask all 8 people they're ordering for what it is they want. But I digress. After we take the order, back of the house puts it together, bagging and packaging everything. Front of the house is then primarily responsible for cashing the person out when they arrive. We do not have a host slash hostess. The issue is, front of the house does the work, but we are not cut into the takeout tips. The family who owns the business has a policy of donating all to-go tips to charities in their home country. There is a big tip jar near the register with a sign that says, Takeout Tips, in bold lettering, and under that in finer print, there is the explanation that all to-go tips are donated. This has been their practice for years, but as takeout business has exploded, resentment among the staff is growing. Quite frequently, dealing with takeout issues takes time from serving our tables. If a day slash night is particularly slow, sometimes the majority of what we do is handing takeout orders. Sometime last year, the manager, one of the owner's daughters, told me they are no longer donating to the particular charity indicated on the tip jar sign and instead will be donating locally. 
I very strongly believe they aren't donating anything at all. One of the servers who has been there for many years said something to the owner about our frustration regarding this issue and they gave us each $200 last Christmas. It's a nice gesture, but they make at least $200 a week in to-go tips. We cash people out. We see what they leave. This has affected our level of service as no one rushes to help people waiting for to-go orders and sometimes the phone will ring and ring as we just refuse to sacrifice our table service, what makes us money, for a to-go order. We resent these customers and I'm not going to pretend I haven't been openly rude to people who just want to pick up their food. Adding insult to injury, people throw their money in the jar thinking the person cashing them out, who is helping them, is going to get a cut of the tip. No one reads the very lengthy explanation of donation practices when we very much do not. It's their business and I guess they can do what they want. However, I'm increasingly uncomfortable doing work I'm not being paid for. The craziest customer I've ever had. I've worked for my craft store company for a year and have managed to work my way up to assistant manager. This story is from several years ago when I was just a lowly cashier and makes me laugh every time I tell it. It was about an hour before closing time and we were very quiet. I was the only cashier scheduled and was stationed at the register furthest away from the queuing area. As I was with a customer, a woman in her mid-40s was next in line. When it was her turn at the register, she stomps up and slams her items on the counter hard enough that most of them bounce off. After I scramble to pick her things up and get them scanned in, she looks at the price that they're ringing up and this is where it really gets started. Customer, that hole punch is supposed to be 50% off. Me, I'm sorry, but this particular brand is excluded from the sale. I can run back and grab one of the ones that are on sale if you'd like. She grunts her approval. I go and get the hole punch and tell her her new total. This is when she discovers that she's slightly short, about 75 cents, but she doesn't want to take anything off. Me, we aren't busy and there's no one behind you. If you have any money in your car or something, I can hold the transaction open for you. I don't mind. So she goes to get some change. When she comes in, this time once again, she slams it on the counter hard enough it bounces. I was prepared this time though and managed to catch it. As I'm entering the amount she's paid, this is when she starts. You're really rude. I hope you know that. Me, taken aback because I thought I had been perfectly friendly. I'm sorry you feel that way, ma'am. I saw you with your hands all over your mouth when you called me up. For the record, no. At most, I maybe scratched the side of my nose, and that's a tick I have. I hope your manager knows what a rude girl she hired. To that one, I just silently handed her her receipt and her bag as there was nowhere productive this was going to go. And as she left and walked towards the door, she turned around and said my favorite thing a customer has ever said to me. You're ugly too. Yes, Karen. Just for you, we will change our million dollar system. This is a story that happened a year or two ago. I can't recall exactly. I work in customer service for a card company. Due to not wanting to be too obvious as to where, there are some slight changes to the story, but not enough to change the events that occurred. A customer called us because she wanted to open a third card in her name with us when our limit is two. Our system lets two applications through and then puts it on hard lock. We couldn't even get around it if we tried to. She had tried to apply for this card and obviously had been denied, and now she was calling us. After explaining to her that unfortunately we cannot open another card in her name, as those are the rules and how our systems work, this is where she informs me that no, she only has one card. Concerned, I start asking questions, like has she lost her card? Do I need to block it and send out a new one? Does she want to cancel it, etc.? No, she was aware that she had two cards, but her other card was used by her son. Well, okay, I said. If your son is over this age, then we can get him a family card under her account so you can use both of your cards. No, he wasn't old enough, so that wasn't possible because we need to be able to verify them in our public registry system, which happens to be at a certain age. And she lost it here on me. I explained to her that unfortunately she would have to wait until her son turned this age to get a card in his name. I was at this point getting fed up with the situation because she wasn't particularly nice in her tone or choice of words. At this point, I had to inform her that by lending out a card with her name on it, that she was violating the terms of service of the card 
and loses the right to dispute any and all possibly wrong transactions or fraud on the card, as she willingly would have given another person permission to the card. Common sense, right? Nope. She then yelled at me that what she wanted to do with her own account was her business, and if she wanted to open a third card, then that was her business and not ours, and that her son needed that card because she was a single mother and XYZ. We're not a bank, mind you. We're a credit card company, and you'd be better off opening a bank account for your son and funnel in some money there. I said that while she was right that we wouldn't force her to comply with the terms of service, well, we could, to be honest. And we couldn't, at this point, do anything about her son using her second card, but by telling us this, she forfeited the right to dispute transactions and that if she chose to give her second card to her son, then that was her choice too. But we have already opened a second card for her and our systems are not compatible with a third one. The application would not even pop up for us as the system automatically deletes it as a duplicate. She was furious with me, threatening to close down her account and wanted to speak to a manager. Here's something I'm glad that is different in my country and culture. The demanding a manager is a weak request and doesn't mean you have a right to speak to one. Honestly, my manager at the time had no clue about anything we did and you'd just speak to another colleague about it. So I just told her that was unfortunate that whenever she wanted to close her account, we were just to call away. And I was not going to register a complaint because this is clearly stated in our terms of service and how our systems work. Honestly, I love telling people who threaten to close their account that I can do it right away or just how easy it is because so many threaten it thinking they will get their way when we honestly don't even care. So many people change their minds immediately. I'm quite brash, rarely say sorry or anything in calls, so dealing with entitled parents like these who think they can do what they want and not face the consequences, do they honestly think we'll cover any potential fraud or disputes on their account when she gave the card to her teenage son who could have done anything with it? Or that we'd just change a million to billion dollar computer system and back office slash workflow management just for her? When realizing I was not sympathetic to her complaints and that she was getting nowhere, she hung up on me. And I don't know what she ended up doing. Company recruits me for a senior position, project gets cancelled while I'm interviewing, and I'm supposed to pay for the trip? I don't think so. During the dot-com boom in the late 90s, I became somewhat well-known for my expertise with a now somewhat obsolete networking technology. I ended up getting heavily recruited by a big telecom firm in Denver to run the technical side of a huge networking project they had underway. After multiple phone interviews, I was invited out for the big in-person sit-down, a two-day affair where I met with the big dogs, other techies, HR, etc. It was a pretty awesome opportunity. Took the trip. First day of meetings went great. I felt it was a great match, etc. I did sense there was some tension between two groups over network architecture. Turned out that was one of the reasons they were bringing in someone more senior who could finalize the approach and get the project moving. That was fine, all part of the job, whatever. Got wined and dined after the first day, was definitely feeling like the job was a match and that I'd be moving to Denver. Went in the second day, and after another round of interviews, the division head takes me to lunch. That's when it all blew up. While we were at lunch, the firm's senior management canned the entire project and fired every person associated with it. Apparently, there was a huge internal conflict going on. We get back from lunch, and the manager escorts me to HR, where we're going to sit down and go over their offer. Instead, he's told what's going on, and that he's out of a job along with everyone else on the project. At this point, I was told to leave. No apologies, it was just crappy luck for me. What the heck? Okay then, I'm gone. I get back to the hotel and there's a voicemail for me asking me to call the HR people. I'm upset, but I call. They tell me they've had to cancel my return ticket and that I'd need to pay for the hotel myself now, but that if I would submit an expense report, they might be able to get me a check. There's a second voicemail from the front desk asking me to provide a credit card for the stay. And then I get a call on my cell phone from the car rental company, which I didn't answer. Turns out they also wanted my credit card. Forget that. I called the airline and they said my reservation had indeed been cancelled, but they also acknowledged that the reservation was paid for using a fully refundable ticket, which I was holding and which back in the 90s was essentially as good as cash. Said they wouldn't know for certain if I could board until I showed up at the counter with the physical ticket. Great. Just great. 
I'm on the hook for several thousand in airfare, nice hotel, and rental car after taking several days of vacation from my job for this interview? I don't think so. Here's the revenge. I packed my bags and loaded up the rental car, left the keys in the hotel room door, drove the rental car back to Dallas, stayed overnight in Amarillo, dropped the rental car at the Hertz lot at Dallas-Fort Worth Airport, took their shuttle to the terminal I had left my car at, and drove home. Over the next few months, I got several nasty phone calls from their HR and accounting departments demanding I pay them back for the trip, including paying the $700 drop-off fee for the car. Never answered them, of course, just let them go to voicemail. Eventually got a demand letter from their legal department, paid an attorney a nominal fee to send them a demand for compensation slash threaten a lawsuit letter. Never heard from the firm again. Side note, the ticket itself was still valid. I ended up selling it to a friend at a big discount and he was able to use it. I am not your personal shopper. My district manager would come to my campus once a month to go over accounts with me and to help me with issues I might have been facing. I was the office manager for a ground campus school that offered certificates in medical assisting, billing and coding, digital multimedia and web design as well as computer repair, etc. The district manager always came on Friday as school was only a half day and staff left at 1.30 p.m. also. So the district manager and I got to talking about personal things and she mentions that she is going to a fancy event but hasn't had the time to go shopping. Well, I am all about the shopping and ask what did she need. She tells me she needs some clothes but she hasn't been able to get the right fit. The district manager is pretty sizable so I tell her about a plus size shop near campus that has a huge selection and she can get measured for the right fit and I have a coupon. We go shopping. We get to the shop in a mall and the store is not big, just a rectangle that is open so you can see all the way to the back. Very open concept. The store has three fitting rooms on the right wall in the center of the store and two more on the left wall at the back of the store. The checkout is situated in the very center of the store all the way in the back so the staff can see the entire store. As I am a frequent flyer of the store, the day staff recognizes me. I ask if one of them would help with the fitting and they say yes, they would be happy to. While I wait for district manager to get measured, I mosey around wasting time and hope to pick up a sale item. Now, I am dressed in my usual Friday attire of a polo shirt with the name of my school and jeans. I'm also carrying my purse, so clearly I don't work here. A nice lady comes out of a fitting room while I'm roaming the store and checks out her outfit in the mirror and she's tugging on the jacket and frowning. She sees me glance up and asks me what I thought about what she had on. Nice lady tells me hubby is taking her out for their anniversary and she wants to make a good impression. I tell nice lady that I saw a wrap on the other side of the store that was her color and on sale. We go over to look at it and sure enough she loved it. I then say you should really try this dress on, it's perfect for your body type and the color was terrific with her hair and skin tone. She takes it and goes to try it on. I'm still waiting on my district manager and still browsing the store and am peripherally aware that there are about two to three customers in the store. Nice lady comes out of the dressing room wearing the dress and the wrap I showed her and she looks fantastic. She tells me she's getting both items and I say don't forget some jewelry and do you have shoes to go with your outfit at home? Nice lady goes to the register, pays and on the way out the door says thank you for helping me. My district manager comes out of the dressing room and picks out her items and she and I walk around the store on her jacket hunt. I help her to pick out a jacket and she was really happy with her choice and goes to the register to pay. I followed her to the register and had the staff hold my items until I was ready for a fitting room so I could have both hands to dig in the clearance racks when someone behind me says, excuse me. Thinking I was in the way of Miss Excuse Me, I scooted over and said, I'm sorry. I did not mean to get in your way. I then hear, I am in a hurry, so stop what you are doing and come help me put together an outfit. Still, I am elbow deep in the clearance, thinking this jerk is extra rude, and then Miss Excuse Me says, Hello, are you deaf or just stupid? Hurry up and help me, because I am a paying customer. I then realize she's talking to me. I turn around with my polo, clearly showing the name of my school, and say, I don't work here. Entitled Mom then says, Yes, you do. I just watched you helping two customers and talking to the girls at the register. If you were just a customer, you would not do that. You either help me or I will complain and get you fired. Entitled Mom then says, I come in here all the time and I spend a lot of money in this store. 
so I want a personal shopper too. Come help me right now. Honest to God, I thought she was going to stomp her feet to emphasize her point. Again, ma'am, I don't work here. Another, yes you do. Me, okay, what the heck? Now I was feeling kind of spicy because Entitled Mom called me a liar, stupid, and asked if I was deaf, so I reply. I think you are exaggerating, because if you really came in all the time and spent lots of money, I would know who you were. I followed up with, only our special customers get the assistance of the store's personal shopper, and you are just not that special. Entitled Mom stomped her way back to the register to tell the staff how rude I was, and she wanted to speak to the manager because I should be fired. One of the staff told her I did not work there and the store did not employ a personal shopper. Speaking of stores, what's your all-time favorite store to shop at? Please let me know. Production assistant thinks she's my boss. A bit of background. I work in the film and television industry. On this particular shoot, I was the BBE, best boy electrician, the foreman of the electrical department working directly under the gaffer slash chief lighting technician. The duties of a BBE include things like filling out time cards for my department, hiring the lighting technicians, electricians, keeping the truck organized, and on this show, driving the grip slash electric truck. One fine morning, I pull up to set, park my truck, and shut off the engine. I open up the back, then I head into set to greet the gaffer and BBG and see where the gaffer wants things staged for the day and what equipment we'll be pulling out first and around whereabouts distro needs to be run. Once I get my instructions, I head back to the truck and I find someone on it who I don't recognize. She's rummaging around the shelves looking through the milk crates, completely ignoring me. Now, it's not impossible for me to not recognize someone on the truck. The best boy Grip may have brought on a day player if he's shorthanded that day, so I go introduce myself. Me. Hey, how are you today? Her. Oh, good. You must be a production assistant. Can you tell me where the spike tape is? Spike tape is marking tape, usually used for setting actors' marks. Me. Oh, probably with the camera department. Uh, I'm sorry. Who are you? Her. I'm just looking for the... Never mind. She found my personal rolls. I keep two colors for my own use, and I use one of them to tag my drinks, and the other one for setting marks when I do steady cam. These rolls are mine. They don't belong to the truck, nor to the production. She jumps down off of the deck of the truck and starts to head towards the set. Me. Wait, stop. That's not camera department's tape. Do you want me to walk you the second assistant camera for you? Her. What do you mean? It's spike tape, isn't it? I'm the key production assistant, which makes me your boss. Plus, I was the production manager on mid-tier local web series, so you should know who I am. Me. These roles are mine, actually. They have my name written on them. No, they have the BBE's name on them. The assistant director told me to ask him but he wasn't by the truck. I'm the BBE. No, you're not. You're just some local university freshman. I know the BBE. I have his phone number. Why don't you go ahead and call him? She grabs a call sheet from her back pocket, then finds my number, dials it, and puts the phone to her ear. After a second staring at me with hostility, my phone starts to ring. I take it out of my pocket and answer. Give me my tape. Stay off of the truck. Production assistants are not allowed to touch grip or electric equipment. I hang up. She gives me the tape and slinks off. Cut to around lunch and I see her lurking around grip staging area and round the corner just fast enough to see her walking off with a couple of apple boxes. I hang around staging for a while, eat my lunch, then start doing the rounds and making sure everything is ready to get back to work after lunch. I run across the two apple boxes next to a lunch box, a metal box with a bunch of outlets in it, run from our generator to power lower wattage lights. She had unplugged a light in order to charge her phone, which was left on top of the box. I unplug her phone and take it straight to the assistant director. I talk to the assistant director about it. Production assistants don't handle electric for any reason. We're pretty strict about that. And she was asked to go home after lunch. Turns out she had also spent the entire day hovering over the director's shoulder and bossing around the other production assistants despite the fact that she wasn't actually the key production assistant. It also turns out that she was a senior at the university she said I was a freshman from. I have not seen her since. I have no idea why she thought I was a production assistant. Brother tells me that I can consider myself an only child over some keys and money. Cast, not real names. 
We've got me, we've got my brother, Richard, we've got my cousin, Julie, and we've got my cousin's husband, Hale. Backstory. I rented a house with my cousin, Julie, and her husband, as well as their two kids, because they were on the verge of being homeless, and I was also at the end of my lease. Three months in, they illegally evicted me because I told them I'd have someone over in my room. I paid my half of the bills. We got the place together, and they didn't like that. My brother bought me out, and I had five days to leave. It was the beginning of January, but I'd already paid rent, so I was promised my rent and security deposit back. My brother claimed he would be paying it, but I had Julie and Hale sign an agreement that I would give the keys to my room and the shed back after rent was paid at least. Also, it said I'd be paid security deposit as well. My brother has a history of not paying people back, including our father, grandmother, and aunt, Julie's mom, so I already don't have much trust here. My brother gave me $230 of the $500 rent in February. The end of February comes, and I ask when he's going to pay me more, as he said he would have done by now. I'm paraphrasing here, but... Richard. I will let you know when I have more money. I want the keys back now, though. Me. Not until you pay at least rent back. Richard. That's ridiculous. I should have the keys to my house. Don't make this more difficult than it needs to be. Stop being petty and immature. Me. Julie and Hale agreed to this and signed an agreement. It's not my fault they didn't tell you, apparently. I'm not being petty. I just want my money now that I have to find a place. You chose to buy me out. Richard. I can't believe you. I only wanted to help Julie and Hale since you were going to leave the house anyway. I just want my money. Then I'll give you the keys as they agreed. Picture of signed agreement. He ghosted me for a week until I texted him again asking when he'd be paying me. I'll be paying you with my taxes. If you want it sooner, then you can ask Grandma for it, and I will pay her back. Me. Are you serious? You already owe Grandma over $1,000. This is your debt, not hers. I'm not asking Grandma for money. Then you can wait. And where are the keys? On my keychain, where they are all the time. I already told you that I won't give them over until I get my rent back. You can take your time repaying whoever else you owe money, like Daddy, but not me. I'm not doing this with you. Considering you threatened to hold money back if I dragged my feet, moving out? This is ridiculous. Just pay me back, Richard. Richard. I just filed my taxes. You'll get your money when I get my taxes back. Don't ever talk to me like that ever again. You can consider me lost as a brother. Congratulations. So, if you're hard pressed for it, ask grandma. Otherwise, you can have it when I get my taxes. And I expect you never talk to me like that again. Reasons he can't pay now and why I'm being disrespectful, and this is my fault? Me. I'm not doing anything. If that's how you feel, no, that was your choice. This was all a choice you made, and there are consequences to kicking me out like that. I have nothing to say to you. You'll get your money back when you do. Have a good day, and consider yourself an only child. Me. Sorry if you're upset by my wording, because I still wish the best for you, but I literally got betrayed by my brother. So my wording is the least of the offense. I was just at the end of my rope. I still am because I'm hurt, but that's besides the point. I'll text you in two weeks, or you can tell Grandma and she can talk to me. He has left me on red. This was last week. Where do you think I work? So, Sunday morning. I'm wearing jeans with the knees almost worn through because my good ones are in the wash. I've got mud splatters up to my knees because I thought I'd grab groceries on the way back for my morning jog, giving them time to open. I'm wearing a green t-shirt, bearing a picture of Calvin and Hobbes dressed up as Maul and Jane. This is the height of fashion for me, and I have to say, it doesn't look like any kind of uniform. I stop in the biggest supermarket in town and start picking out some vegetables for a curry. Then I notice that where I normally get a pack of three peppers, there's packs of two for the same price. Normally, I just assume it's a stealth price raise and grumble about it under my breath. But today, I've got a coupon for 60 bonus points on the store's loyalty card, which specifically says it's for three peppers. That's frustrating, and I wonder if there's a member of staff around who I can ask. I mean, it's not such a big deal, but if I speak to someone, they'd probably be able to ensure I get the points. Not to mention, there's a huge crowd at the checkouts. On Sundays, they don't open the checkouts until the store's been open about an hour, so whether I can find someone to help me or not, I'll be hanging around for at least another 10 minutes. I stand at the end of the aisle, craning my neck and looking out for uniforms. The uniform here is a pretty distinctive dark red with orange details. You can see them from a mile off. But the only two I see are helping someone else. 
so I resign myself to standing waiting until it's possible to get close to the checkouts without pushing through the crowd. Loitering on the corner, pacing back and forth, trying not to get in anyone's way. I can see how that might have looked employee-ish if it weren't for the outfit. Anyway, I'm glancing over the shelves occasionally and trying to keep out of the way of anyone who might be looking at the shelves behind me, and I hear a shrill voice. Give me a bag of potatoes. I turn around and she's standing there glaring at me, then turns and points at a display of bagged washed potatoes. She's a little shorter than me, with gray hair and a rather severe bun, a green suit that could have been church attire, and a scowl that could have been permanently etched into her face by years of constant use. The potatoes she's pointing at are on the top shelf and between us, so I'm not in her way, but I've got intermittent joint issues in my right shoulder and I know if she has something similar, she could have trouble reaching them. So I lift down a bag of spuds and hand them to her. Not like I've got anything better to do. She puts them in her basket and moves away a couple of steps. She could have said thanks, but I didn't hear her. I return to browsing r slash Dunsons and Dragons memes on my phone while I wait for the cues to disperse a little. A minute passes and then, excuse me, look up and she's back, glaring right at me, one hand on her hip. Behind her, I notice that it must have reached the appointed hour because people are starting to filter through the checkouts. I should be going, but if this lady needs help reaching something, I can help her again before I leave. Do you need some help? Radishes. I gesture towards the shelf where she'll find them, but she just glares. So, taking the easy way out, I walk a few steps over and take a bag off the shelf to hand to her. Again, no thank you. Just a disappointed, <laughs> and I need prunes. By this point, I can see that there's actually a space at the closest checkout. I really should get home, as I hadn't factored in Sunday opening hours when I made plans for the day, and I didn't know where prunes would be found. I could make a guess though. I don't know where those are, but most of the tin stuff is on aisle 4, 5, and 6. Oh, if you need help, there's a member of staff by the… She ignores where I'm pointing and steps closer, right in my face, close enough that her shopping basket clangs against mine. Go get me prunes. Fresh ones. Me. I'm sorry, I don't think they sell prunes. Young people now have no sense of responsibility. If I was your age, we would have been finished by now. Laziness. Me. Lady. I don't work with maybe a quarter of a smile as I realize I've got an excuse to say those words. I swear, can't you even do the simplest things? You're in enough trouble already, young lady. Why are you even here if you're not going to help a customer with the smallest things? I'm doing my shopping. I don't exactly. You're messing around in the supermarket and not even helping your valued customers. In my day, once you were clocked in, you would be behind that desk all day, not wasting someone's time at the shops. I'm going to be here this afternoon, and if you're not on best behavior, then God help me. I'll tell your manager that you were rude to me and slacking off doing your shopping during work hours. You believe me, you won't have that job much longer. Me, confused. She turns around and storms off towards the exit, stomping her feet. Not towards the checkout or the canned food aisles. She was heading straight for the exit. I honestly have no idea who she thought I worked for and why she would expect me to help with her groceries if I don't work at the supermarket. I hope she found someone who could actually help her, or at least remembered she had a basket of shopping before leaving the store. I didn't see, because after that I was queuing to buy my stuff. I have no idea what was going through her head. Any suggestions or guesses would be appreciated. So Karen, what did you think of today's stories? They were horrible. Horrible? How dare you? These were some of the best we've ever read. Oh, shut up, Mr. Reddit. It's ridiculous what people like myself have to go through. Dealing with stupid people like yourself and your subscribers. Look, Karen, you can say whatever you want about me, but don't you talk about my re-army. Tch, re-army. Most of your viewers aren't even subscribed to your channel. 70% if I'm correct. Well, I can't argue with that. That's true, most... Most of my viewers don't actually subscribe for some reason. It's because you're stupid, Mr. Reddit. No, I'm not. All right, guys, let's prove Karen wrong by making sure you're subscribed to the channel and turn on notifications. Pah, they're not going to listen to you. And if you'd like me or Karen, what? To record a special message for you, come visit me on Fiverr. Link pinned in the comments below. Never. And join as a channel member today and Karen will give you a special shout out in the next video. Like heck I will!